Good evening, councillors. You're most welcome to our first meeting in the chamber. Um, if, gentlemen, if it does get warm, you have my permission to take off your jackets. Thank you. Um, a very warm welcome to you all. And I would advise members that the meeting is being live streamed and everyone should await their microphone light turning red before speaking in order to be heard. I'm just going to read the evacuation information. The building fire alarm signal is continuous to tone alarm. On hearing the evacuation alarm, please leave the building by the nearest marked exit route. Follow the signs to the assembly point, large staff car park opposite the entrance to the building. Anyone who cannot use the stairs will be helped by the officers present after other people have left. Please do not return to the building until told, say, until told it is safe to do so by an authorised officer. The whole of the council site is a no smoking area. Filming from the public gallery is permitted, but members must please refrain from filming within the council chamber so as not to distract the meeting. Please, mobile phones must be switched to silent. Thank you. So item one is to, uh, to elect the election of the chairman. So I'm going to pass this to our legal officer, Tom Clark. Thank you. Um, I'm asking for nominations for the chairman of the charity trustees. Um, just to remind members, normally the chairman of the charity trustees is the same chairman as uh, council. So if I could ask for nominations, please. And I nominate the chairman. Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> so, Councillor Coote has nominated Margaret Belsey. Is there a seconder? Seconder from um, Jonathan Ash Edwards. Do I have any other nominations? Seeing none, can I hand the meeting uh, to Margaret Belsey? Thank you, Tom. So I'm now going to um, ask for any nominations for Vice Chairman. Um, I'm going to nominate, as my nice Vice Chairman, <laughs> Councillor Philip Coote. May I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Ash Edwards. So are there any other nominations from the floor for Vice Chairman? No, I see none. So, Philip, Councillor Cooch, you are now the Vice much. Chairman, and thank you very much. So we're going to move on to item three, to confirm as a correct record the minutes of the meeting held on the 26th of January, item, pages three to four on your agenda. Could I ask members to verbally agree the minutes? Agree. Thank you. Item four, to receive declarations of interest from members in respect of any matter on the agenda. Um, any members wishing to speak by pressing the button or microphone under your name, as you have been instructed. I don't see any declarations of interest. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Councillor Peter Chapman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to declare a personal interest in item number six because I am a very good friend of the applicant who is looking for the long-term lease on St John's Park, uh, the kiosk, so I will leave the chamber during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. That's the Chairman. Um, I see no other people wishing to, councillors wishing to speak. <coughs> Just wait for the councillors to settle down. Okay, I'm going to move on now to item five to consider any items that the chairman of the charity trust agreed to take as urgent business. I have none. So I'm going to move on to item six. Thank you, Councillor Chapman. This item is St John's Park Charitable Trust, Burgess Hill, West Sussex, charity number 305189, the proposed lease disposal of the pavilion kiosk. I'm going to invite the head of our regulatory services, Tom Clark, to speak. Thank you, Chairman. Um, what is proposed in the report is a five-year lease of the kiosk. The kiosk forms part of the pavilion building, and in order to build flexibility, uh, there is a notice period within the lease of 12 months, um, which will allow that flexibility. 
The lease is at a commercial rent. You'll see it's been endorsed by an outside valuer. So as trustees, it is fine for you to agree this lease uh, because it protects the situation of the charity. Thank you. Have any members got any questions or comments? Please indicate via your microphone, you, if you do so wish to speak. I don't have any members indicating they wish to speak, so I'm going to move the item from the chair. The recommendations being voted on for the benefit of members, viewers and listeners is as follows. The recommendations are on page 10. The charity trustees are recommended to, under 11.1, note the absence of any responses to the statutory advertisements placed in the Mid-Sussex Times on 17th, 7th and 14th of April 2022, giving notice of the charity trustees' intention to grant the proposed lease and note and consider the proposal set out in paragraph 3.2 of this report and the independent surveyor's report and 11.2, if, having considered this report and the independent surveyor's report, the charity trustees <coughs> consider that it is in the best interest of the charity to grant the proposed lease to the prospective tenant, to authorise the charity trustees solicitor to grant the lease on the terms set out in this report and the independent surveyor's report, and on such other terms as the charity trustees solicitor recommends or considers appropriate. Could members please vote? on this recommendation by using the microphone touch screen. Please vote now. Is everyone comfortable that they've voted? Who's going to tell us that everyone's voted? Is it me? I think you're right. Well, we haven't shown. I think they're trying to vote. I think they're trying to vote. I think we are. That's. Right. The, the voting results are in, as you can see, we have a 76% yes vote, no, uh, nil percent no, and we had 2% abstention, so the motion is carried. Oh, I'm so sorry, you should have announced it yourself. I do apologise. <laughs> sorry, slight gift. I am now going to, does um, Councillor Chapman wish to come back in? Of course, we thought we would wait for you. <laughs> so we're moving on now to conclude the meeting. Uh, the time is uh, seven minutes to seven, and ask the members to remain seated. Uh, the public speakers will now be admitted by the council.
You're all most welcome to this uh, Mid Sussex District Council Council Chamber and the meeting this evening. Um, there are a couple of things I would like to um, point out. I'd like to remind members that the meeting is being live streamed and everyone should await the microphone light turning red before speaking. I've also been, um, although some of you have been in an earlier meeting, I am going to read the evacuation alarm message again as we have people in the gallery, public gallery. On the building fire alarm signal is a continuous two-tone alarm. On hearing the evacuation alarm, please leave the building by the nearest marked exit route. Please follow the green signs to the assembly point, large staff car park opposite the entrance to the building. Anyone who cannot use the stairs will be helped by the officers present after other people have left. Please do not return to the building until, until told it is safe to do so by an authorised officer. The whole of the council site is a no smoking area. Filming from the public gallery is permitted, but members must please refrain from filming within the council chamber so as not to distract the meeting. Please remember that mobile phones must be switched to silent. Thank you. I'm going now going to ask the Vice Chairman to read the opening prayer. Thank you, Chairman. O oh Lord, grant us courage to strive for what is right and good. Courage to listen to those of different opinion. Strengthen us through difficulties and pressures and guide us in our deliberations so that we may act in the interest of all in our district. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I'm going to move on to item two to receive questions from members of the public pursuant to council procedure rule nine. I would point out that there are seven questions received and a time of 15 minutes has been allocated for this item. And in order to accommodate the number of questions that we have received, it will not be necessary to read the question out loud. It will appear on the screen and has been tabled for members to read. I will therefore go straight to the answers. If you wish to pose a supplementary question related to the answer received, we will take a note of it and respond in writing, just to be clear at the outset. So the first question is from Mr. Bate, who is not in attendance. So the, uh, the question has been tabled and um, is available on the screen. I'm going to ask Councillor Salisbury to provide a response. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening, members. I think the, the question was prompted when Councillor Ash Edwards was referring to the district plan review. The district plan review and the sites allocation DPD are at different stages in the plan making process. Plan making is lengthy and complex, and all DPDs must go through two rounds of public consultation and an examination in public. The site allocation DPD is, at, is the at the most advanced stage in plan making terms. It's been through two rounds of public consultation and a public examination. The independent planning inspector has found it sound and legally compliant with legislation. Proposed future changes to the planning system are not yet law. The site's DPD is therefore unaffected by them. In examining the plan, the inspector reviewed detailed evidence put forward by all parties, including ecological reports and assessments, and concluded that, the, concluded that the sites were sound and capable of adoption. Policies SA 12 and 13 include specific requirements regarding green infrastructure, conserving and enhancing wildlife value, and ensuring a net gain to biodiversity. These will all need to be satisfied at the planning application stage. And it's worth noting that plan making and planning applications are two different processes. One sets policy, the other applies that policy. It's now up to the council to either adopt the site's DPD or not. In comparison, the district plan review is at a very early stage. All the evidence is still being gathered and no decisions have been made. It has not yet been through the first round of public consultation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Salisbury. It's not the opportunity to give us, there's no supplementary question as Mr. Bate is not in attendance. I'm going to move on to question two from Ms. Green. Are you here this evening? Ms. Green. Okay. So, um, 
The question has been tabled and is available on the screen. So you will have a response to this question, again from Councillor Salisbury, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the question, Mr. It provides me with an opportunity to clarify the situation. Plan making, as I said earlier, is very complex. In fact, it never stops. When the Council adopted the district plan in March 2018, the inspector stipulated that the Council must also adopt a site allocations DPD to account for the increased numbers that he put in. The inspector confirmed that the approach to be taken by the Council to bring forward a site's DPD at an early date was sound. Separate to this, the Council is also required to review the district plan every five years. This review started in 2021 and the draft was presented to the Scrutiny Committee for Housing and Planning in January of this year. The committee resolved to delay their consideration of the plan to enable officers to do more work. This work continues, and once it's completed, as resolved by the Scrutiny Committee, a cross-party working group will consider the sites and any proposed changes to policies. This work will then be scrutinised by the Scrutiny Committee. The Sites Allocation DPD is a sister document to the current district plan and is at a different stage to the district plan review. As outlined in Para 36 of the report under the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004, the Council can only make a binary choice to either adopt the DPD or not. Whilst the five-year housing land supply has been confirmed by an independent inspector, this assumes the DPD is adopted and the sites in it, including sites to SA 12 and 13, will be delivered. Failure to adopt the DPD will place the Council at significant risk of not having five-year housing land supply, leaving the district vulnerable to speculative development. Such speculative development is very likely to include sites 12 and 13. This is because now the site's DPD has been found sound. Developers will argue that this is a material consideration in the determination of applications, irrespective of whether the Council adopts it or not. Should a planning application be submitted on any of the sites, officers will have to take the inspector's report into account in any decision. It's important to note that during the seven-year period prior to the adoption of the current district plan, when the council did not have an up-to-date plan and was not able to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply, 3,000 dwellings were built on greenfield sites. With respect to the levelling up and regeneration bill, the government has stated it will not enact, be enacted until 2024. In the meantime, the Council must operate within the context of existing legislation. Finally, I should stress that the government is clear that plan making must continue. In a written ministerial statement in January 2021, Chris Pincher, the Minister of State for Housing, said that authorities should not use this period during the reform of the planning system as a reason to delay plan making activities. Authorities who have an up to date plan in place will be in the best position to adopt, adapt to the new plan making system. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Salisbury. Uh, Ms. Green, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Yeah. Can I just say that um, it, you will not receive a, a reply this evening. A response will be provided in writing to you after the. Uh, just a couple of things, really. By the time the developers can challenge your five-year land supply, the changes to planning law and the housing targets will either have been changed or they'll, well in, they'll be well in hand, and so they would carry weight then in any legal defence. And it just seems, why aren't you prepared to take a stand for these sites and defend them against the developers at, the, at this stage? And at the recent Stop Cookstein meeting, Jonathan Ash Edwards said, we need to ensure we are taking account of the government's changes to the planning system and cited environmental concerns as the reasons for pausing the district plan review, but you refuse to explain why these environmental concerns and changes to the planning system don't apply to SA12 and SA13. You're going over the same thing again, or oh, it's still, you know, that it's got further on, all the rest of it, but that doesn't explain why you're just ignoring the environmental concerns. Even Mims Davis can see this now, and I believe that quite a lot of you are actually Conservatives, and she has now written to Michael Gove saying, I urge you to urgently relook at the forced inclusion of these particular sites. She's written today, look at this decision again. 
and it will mean you have a better supported district plan reflecting the hard work that you have done on it. We're not suggesting that you throw it out because we know how much hard work's been done on it. What we are suggesting is that you pause it while these sites are looked at again and while the changes to the planning legislation come in. So please, you. could you answer that? It will, a reply will be given, provided Thank in writing. Thank you. Can I ask Mrs Parlett to join us? The, your question has been tabled and is available, so um, I'm going to ask Councillor a response for you to your question from Councillor Salisbury. Uh, thank, you again. Uh, thank you again, Chairman, and thank you, uh, Ms. Parlett, for, for providing the question, um, which actually enables us to have a look at um, the biodiversity um, net gain. Thank you for this. It's important to note that the statutory biodiversity net gain requirements do not come into effect until 2023. However, given the Council's commitment to the environment, we want to ensure that uh, the biodiversity net gain was a requirement of all sites that are coming forward. I don't agree that site SA13 will be concreted over, as you suggest in your question. The policy framework to this site is clear that the development should be informed by a landscape-led master plan which responds to the setting of the South Downs National Park. The policy also sets out comprehensive site requirements regarding biodiversity and green infrastructure, including the need to provide a habitat management plan, which must set out how the proposals would conserve and enhance all areas of habitat of principal importance. The independent planning inspector noted that the ecologically, ecological delivery report submitted in support of this allocation confirms that there are no overriding ecological constraints to development of the site and that the proposal could deliver biodiversity net gain overall. The inspector concluded that any ecological impact on the site can be mitigated to an acceptable level and therefore found the allocation to be sound. The assessment of any future planning application on this site will have to consider how the detailed proposals submitted accord with the biodiversity requirements of the Environment Act the National Planning Policy Framework and Policy SA13, which is in the document. Um, and I think whether you heard earlier, all of these sites have to go through a very rigorous planning application process where all of those things will be looked at in detail. Okay, thank you. Do you wish to ask a supplementary question? Yes, I would actually. Please proceed. This will be answered yes. in writing at a later date. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, I'm, it's brilliant that you have so much hope in this system because it seems to me that the developers seem to get round it all the way along. In fact, some of the, um, the, the colleges that come to the site, if you look on the website where they work, it actually says, we can get planning, help you get your planning through whatever. So they're quite biased, we find. And already we know that... Um, a screening application has been put through on this site, so they don't have to do their proper environmental study as well. And Persimmon have told us, you say they won't concrete over um, and they're going to go through correct procedure. Firstly, I want to know how you're going to actually manage, a, manage and monitor that. And secondly, Persimmon have told us they plan to clear the site in autumn. They've told us in writing that. And they do that, as you probably know, to destroy all the biodiversity there. So when it comes to putting the planning application in, there's nothing there. So they will achieve their 10% net gain because they've destroyed everything in the first place. We know already they've been on the site. We've seen, they've claimed that they've not been upsetting the badgers, for example, but they have been. They've been very near the badger sets. We've been monitoring it. So I know that all these things are put out and laid out and they should be adhered to, but we know, we know what developers are like. We know that for them, they have their own interests and they will do all they can to get their, their housing number. So we're asking you to try and pause this tonight to try and stop this precious site from being destroyed in the autumn. Because if you vote tonight for this to go through, the, um, there's nothing to stop them in the autumn from clearing it because it's their own site. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, could I ask Miss Corbett to come through? Good evening. As I've told the other 
the you don't need to read the question it's tabled and the it's on the screens so um i will ask i believe it's councillor oh what a surprise it's councillor salisbury could i ask you to give a response to miss corbett thank you please? chairman i'm tempted to leave this microphone on there's some, another line of these coming up <laughs> um, first of all thank you miss corbett for asking the question uh, and I have to say, it's very heartening to see somebody of your age being so concerned about the environment. And I hope that you'll continue to do so. I'm, and I, but I'm sorry you're concerned about what's going on, and I hope we can reassure you. The Council is delivering the government's objectives, and it has a very difficult job to do. We must ensure that there are enough homes for people to live in, because you're going to want one one day, while seeking to protect important natural habitats. Site SA13 is not protected in the same way as site, a site that is nationally recognised for protection, such as ancient woodland or a site of special scientific interest or the high wheeled area of outstanding natural beauty. However, even in areas which do not have a national protection, the government still wants to ensure that there is a net gain in biodiversity. Site SA13 is big enough to ensure that areas of existing wildlife value can be protected as well as providing opportunities for improvements to biodiversity while still delivering new homes. The council policy requires developers to demonstrate how they will achieve this and can be secured as part of any planning permission. The council wants to ensure that not only are there enough homes to meet local needs for future generations, but that we also protect and enhance biodiversity. So I hope that gives you some comfort that we are working on this to, to protect the land. Ms. Corbett, do you wish to ask a supplementary question? Can I ask on her behalf? Of course. Yeah. So um, I think the point has been made by the previous questioner um, that the, anyone that's been anywhere near the site would understand that a net gain in biodiversity is a fantastic, um, uh, fantastically unachievable. You go to site go and look at the place i'd implore all of you councillors to pause get to site have a look it's teeming with wildlife absolutely teeming with wildlife and to think that you can go in there build for three or four years right interrupt all of that wildlife and somehow have a net gain is just naive okay so it's, your supplementary question is is how are you going to do that so okay. I, I'd, I'd employ you to come and i'd also ask the question we talk about how the council hold developers to account on this biodiversity net gain. Could we see some published evidence where the council has got some metrics of how they measure that and how they enforce that and the, the track record of doing that, please? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask uh, Mr. Inman to come? You don't need to read the question, it is being tabled and it is on the screen. So I will take, uh, I'll ask Councillor Salisbury to respond to your question, please. Thank you again, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Inman, for posing the question, which is related, okay. in fact, to the, the question we had from Ms. Colbert. It's important to remember that site applications and plan making and the determination of planning applications are two very separate processes. The planning inspector was satisfied that any ecological impact on the site can be mitigated to an acceptable level, and therefore he found this, the allocation of the site to be sound. But when considering a planning application for SA13, the council will require the applicant to submit evidence to demonstrate how the policy requirements set out in policy SA13 regarding biodiversity and green infrastructure will be met. Finally, it's important to remember that biodiversity net gain can, by law, be delivered on-site, off-site, or in a combination of the two. Thank you. Yes, you wish to ask a supplementary question, which will not be answered here tonight, but you will receive a okay. written response. Thank you. But just a question, please. Yeah. Uh, I'd like, firstly like to say there was no ecological survey before the site was selected. So... Um, You've selected it without actually knowing what was there. Um, I'd also like, to, I mean, I can give a categorical, definite cast iron assurance to Mid Sussex District Council that if this development, SA12 and SA13 in particular, goes ahead, that the nightingales will leave, the hazel dormice will leave, the marsh orchids will vanish, the heath spotted orchids will disappear, 
The woodcock will flee, the barn owls will leave, the badgers will leave, the polecats will quit, the white throats, the bullfinches, the willow warblers, and the kestrels will go and not return. The grass snakes will disappear, the ragged robin flowers will not survive, seven species of bat will go, the emperor moths will vanish, the small tortoise shells will disappear, and many hundreds of trees will be cut down. Your question, please. My question is, if the development go, does go ahead, will Mid-Sussex District Council prove that there has been an increase in diversity? Thank you. A written response for the provider. I'm going to ask uh, Mr Brooks, is he with us this evening? Would you like to... Uh, your question has been tabled and is available on the screen. So, as a surprise, I'm, get, oh, I'm going to ask um, Councillor Hillier to respond. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you very much indeed for the question, uh, Mr Brooks. Um, the short answer, or the first part, is the action plan is not yet complete. Um, the first phase of this work is actually with the consultants, which is now almost complete, which is to baseline our current <coughs> emissions. That report's imminent, and the next stage then will be to bring it to Council, uh, where we will then look at an action plan to achieve uh, net zero. So we would hope to be... Um, setting that target by the council towards the end of this year. Um, once we've set the target, then in place will go the action plan to achieve it. Um, and in relation to the second part of your question, to date the council has expended £47,000 on this work, plus a further £4,000 to extend the contract. The extension was to take account of COVID-related delays. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Mr Briggs, Brooks, would you like to ask a supplementary question to which a written response will be provided. Uh, yes, I would. Please uh, go ahead. I did have one lined up, but just to clarify, once uh, Ricardo are finished with their action plan, will that be made public? It will. And we can expect that fairly soon. Okay. You will receive written confirmation of the <laughs> response, unless Mr. Uh, Councillor Hillier wishes to respond at this time. As I say, um, we should be setting the target towards the end of this year, and then immediately follow will be the action plan. Everything will be in the public domain. It's very important. All councillors will see it. All councillors will have a chance to comment upon it, and it will go through scrutiny. So, yes, it will be very much in the public domain. Thank you. So, um, we have overrun our time, but this is such an important issue. Um, I have allowed this to go further. So, now we're at the last question. We are from question, Councillor Moore from Tandridge District Council. Mm -hmm. Councillor Moore. <coughs> um, your, your question has been tabled and is available on the screen and I'm going to ask for a response to your question from Councillor Salisbury. Thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you, Councillor, for, for posing the question. As a district councillor yourself, you'll be aware that the council have a duty to meet the area's housing need. This council is required by the inspector to bring forward a site allocations DPD. As a councillor, you'll be aware that plan making is both democratic and prescribed. This means any allocation of a site must be evidence-based, and this includes evidence of any impact on infrastructure and the environment. You'll also be aware that this evidence is in the public domain. Specifically regarding highways infrastructure, the inspector carefully considered the evidence and has confirmed in his report that he's satisfied that the Mid-Sussex Strategic Transport Model and Associated Study is fit for purpose. <coughs> You'll also be aware that the plan is subject to two rounds, has been subject to two rounds of public consultation and an examination in public by an independent planning inspector. Following this, the inspector will either find that has, has found the plan sound in the case of the site allocations DPD. And this means he's satisfied that the council has met all the tests. And in, in specific terms around the site that you mentioned, I would draw your attention to SA35 in the document, which covers off the, the work that will be done uh, around the uh, high-risk problems that are created there. Thank you. 
Councillor Moore, would you like to ask a supplementary question, which will receive a written response? Yes, please. Sir. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Felbridge is a fairly conservative-minded village where building on precious farmland, well used by locals, is an extremely unpopular choice. If Miss Mid Sussex exceeds its house building target, could it not preserve the beautiful Gullish farmland and its inhabitants for future generations? Thank you. Thank you. You will receive a written response to that question. And thank you very much for coming. Right, we're now moving on to the main agenda, to item three, to confirm the minutes of the meeting of the council held on the 27th of April and the annual council on the 11th of May. May I ask members to verbally agree the minutes? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Item four, to receive declarations of interest from members in respect of any matter on the agenda. Mem mem would members indicate a wish to speak by pressing the button under their name on the microphone if they wish to speak? Uh, Councillor Gibson. I want to declare personal interest in respect of being a county councillor for Inverdown. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Councillor Hillier. Thank you, Chairman. Similarly, in relation to my report and other matters, I'm a West Sussex County Councillor. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Noted. Uh, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Chairman. You won't be surprised to hear that I wish to declare I'm a West Sussex County Councillor. I'm not at all surprised. <laughs> Thank you very much for informing us. Item five, to consider any items that the Chairman of the Council agrees to take as urgent business. I have none. Item six, Chairman's announcements. Um, I would like to remind members about the Mid-Sussex Applause Awards. The nomination period is open and members and the public are encouraged to put forward nominations to recognise the hard work of residents within the district. More information on the award categories and the nomination form is available online at midsussexapplauds.co.uk. I would have urged members to look at this because there are so many people that have done so much during the last pandemic and um, so many people are worthy of being nominated. Thank you. I'd also like to mention that my chairman's, my chairman's charity fundraising concert, which is on the 20th of October, the Swing Nine Jazz will be performing a fantastic evening of high energy, New Orleans and UK swing music at Chequamead Theatre in East Grinstead in support of the Kangaroos Disability Char Club Charity. Tickets will go on sale in July and all members are invited to help support such a worthy course. More details will follow in the coming weeks. Thank you very much for your support on this. So that's my main um, announcements. So I'm going to move on to item seven, which is obviously the main item of the evening's council meeting. It's the site allocation development plan document adoption which is on pages 17 to 264 on your agenda. The item has been, is being proposed by Councillor Salisbury. Do you wish to speak now? I do, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start this by uh, commenting mainly for uh, the public, uh, but uh, possibly for some councillors, what this report does, and more importantly, what it does not. <laughs> the Site Allocations DPD is a sister document to our current district plan. You will, I hope, be aware that at the examination, Mr. Bohr raised our housing numbers significantly above the district's need, but he did allow us more time to incorporate those additional numbers into the plan through a Site's uh, district plan document. He also said that our approach in bringing such a document forward at an early date was sound. Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004 makes it quite clear that an authority may adopt a plan as is, or in our case, as in with major modifications. It goes on to say that the Council does not have the option of removing policies or adopting elements of the plan. We're all aware of the need to control development in our district to prevent unwanted and uncontrolled development. The site's DPD provides much greater certainty in ensuring that the five-year housing land supply 
is sound. There are issues. There always is something contentious for somebody in any site allocation. East Grinstead has concerns about significant tra traffic issues. <coughs> Burgess Hill predominantly with environmental issues. Other sites will have an impact on their immediate neighbourhood which will be unwelcome. However, I can assure you these sites, whilst found sound by the inspector, still have to go through our own rigorous planning approval process to achieve full approval. The inspector's approval is at a high level and does not take into account the many detailed requirements of a reserved matters application. So what happens with this plan rejected? First of all, all the sites have been found sound by a planning inspector. If the five-year housing land supply falls, then the likelihood is that these sites will come forward in any case. The developer will say that the fact that an independent planning inspector has already found them sound is a material consideration, which officers will have to take into account. Other applications will inevitably follow on sites that we don't want. Planning by appeal is the worst possible position for our district and led to 3,000 homes being built on greenfield land in the seven years before we had our district plan in place. And you may wish to know that the uh, defence of those uh, appeals cost us jolly nearly three quarters of a million pounds of public money. There have been many requests for a pause to the process. Unfortunately, there has been conflation of the process of sites DPD and district plan review. They're two separate things. The DPD, as the sister document to our district plan, is a binary decision. It cannot be delayed if it is to support our five-year land supply, nor can it be altered or adjusted. It's either in or it's out. And that decision is tonight. The district plan is a five-yearly review, and the process requires the plan to be updated in terms of both policy and housing requirements, a totally separate work stream. Correspondents have sought to align the pause in the district plan review with the DPD, but as I've explained, such action would be illegal related to the site's DPD. This work has taken nearly four years to go through the process and has been found sound. I'm therefore very pleased, Chairman, to be able to propose it to members for adoption by the Council. Thank you. Thank you. I believe it's, this motion is going to be seconded by Councillor Ashefus. Do you wish to speak now or reserve your right to speak? Thank you, Chairman. I'll reserve my right to speak up uh, at the end, if I may, and I'll, I'll wrap up the debate at the end. Thank you. Um, Councillor Eggerson, I understand you wish to speak. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Firstly, I would like to just thank the officers for all of the, the hard work uh, that they've put into this plan. We all know how stressful uh, this sort of exercise is and the pressures that they get from members of the public and from, from councillors. So I do appreciate their work. Um, I do want, however, uh, to move an amendment to the recommendation and on advice from the monitoring officer, uh, I understand that it would be in order uh, for an amendment to be moved which would defer uh, the adoption of the site allocations uh, DPD. Uh, I do that in, in particular in, in reference to SA12 and SA13 and members will know that since 2019 uh, I have been consistent uh, in my opposition to the inclusion of those sites in the uh, site allocation uh, and on the grounds that members of the public put forward ecologically. If you know that site, you will know how sensitive it is uh, ecologically and environmentally, uh, but also on, on traffic grounds and on strategic grounds, because you know, it doesn't take um, uh, you know, too much wit and intelligence to work out uh, what happens uh, as the years roll forward to this site, um, both to uh, out towards Ockley Lane and Kima Road, uh, but also down to Wellhouse Lane and beyond. We're building in um, incremental uh, er erosion uh, of green space uh, south of Folders Lane and down to, to Hassocks. Now, uh, the matter has been complicated a little bit today uh, because the MP for Mid-Sussex uh, has written to the Secretary of State for levelling up housing and communities, asking the Secretary of State uh, to reconsider... Uh, this plan and in particular the inclusion of SA12 and SA13. 
And were we to adopt this plan tonight, that would rule out the ability of the Secretary of State to act on uh, the request for, from uh, the MP from, uh, for Mid-Sussex. Uh, so, Chairman, I'd like to move uh, an amendment to the recommendations, uh, which would be to uh, delete items one to three uh, and to replace it with defer the adoption of the site allocations development plan document to allow the Secretary of State for levelling up housing and communities to reconsider the inclusion of SA12 and SA13 in the plan document as requested by the MP for Mid-Sussex on the 29th of June 2022. Thank you. That's it. Ferguson, do you have a seconder for your motion? Do you wish to speak? Or do you wish to reserve your right to speak? Um, I'll, I'll reserve my right, thank you. Reserve your right. So, um, I believe we can now di discuss um, the motion before us by given by Councillor Edwards. Yes. Okay, just want to make sure what we're doing. <laughs> so um, we're going to vote on the proposed. We're just going to debate it now. We're so going to de sorry. We're space. going to debate Councillor Eggleston's proposal, um, and I'm going to ask. I have uh, two councillors that wish to speak. Firstly, I have Gary Marsh, Councillor Gary Marsh. Thank you, Chairman. I, I would like to speak also into the main motion, if. Given that chance I think as well. We are now debating I, the. I debate the motion with Councillor Eggleston and Councillor Bennett, but uh, I wish to speak at the main. Yeah. The, what we're here for, if that's okay. Yeah? Yes. Nods. Chairman, um, obviously the opposition, and I call them the opposition, didn't actually listen to a single word that Councillor Salisbury has just said. None of them are in this chamber apart from Councillor Hatton when we started this process. This wasn't something we wanted to do. This was hoisted on us by an independent planning inspector. Do we agree with those sites? No, we don't all agree with those sites. But they were put in, they were being found sound by the inspector, then through to two public consultations, and uh, we're here tonight. If we don't defer it, and we found out, we've, we've been told that we can't defer it, you either do it or you don't, then what happens? We don't have a five-year land supply. If we don't have a five land supply, the people who vote for deferring it or against it will be causing economic mayhem on this country, in our district. Also, political suicide. What are you playing at? We have no choice but to accept it or throw it out. I, for one, have spent many, many years getting the district plan through. I'm looking at Councillor Webster. I'm looking at, well, he's not here, but obviously the late Councillor McNaughton. We work tirelessly with members across the whole spectrum at the beginning to get this through. So therefore, I will not be voting for the amendment, and as you probably gathered, I will be voting for the... Uh, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Marsh. Councillor Cartwright. I will support uh, my friend, uh, Councillor Eggleston, in what he said. Um, in, refer in reference to... Is the microphone on? Speak to the microphone. Speak, speak to the microphone. Speak to the. I'm sorry. I'm wandering away from the microphone. I shall point myself in this direction. Um, yes, I, the mention was made that in the future we will be having cross-party review of the sites before the very front end of the process. Um, I recall earlier, uh, very the, the beginning of, 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 of being a councillor, there was quite a lot of disputation about. SA12 and SA13, and I don't actually think that uh, Councillor Hatton was at the meeting at the time that, that those two were proposed. Uh, I seem to recall Councillor Hatton was, was away on holiday, and it was done in her absence, and she was making the point at that point that she, she, she felt strongly about it. So in terms of moving on, I welcome cross-party uh, review. Uh, I join uh, Councillor Eggleston in commending all the hard work that's gone into it. I think it would be a great pity if we lost this, but it, you know, I, I don't normally speak in favour of, of, of RMP, but I, in this instance, uh, I think she's made a, a hopefully a wise move. Um, 
But I hope also that the, the, the planning process does not get politicised. I don't, don't think it is right that we should be making uh, statements to, to uh, people in, in public meetings saying that these sites would not be considered when we know very well that they will be considered and that due process is what we should be doing. Nobody likes selecting sites for, for planning um, and, and development. Um, and we're in, in a difficult position in this because so much of the district is actually out of bounds for the development as well. So uh, it's a precious piece of work. But I do think in this instance, it would be courteous to our member of parliament if we did allow uh, the, 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 the minister time to opine on this. And if we could, could defer it, I, I think everyone would welcome this very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartwright. Councillor Stephen Hillier, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll, I'll speak with regard to the amendment, but the same speech, if you like, applies to the substantive, but I'll only make it once. Uh, first of all, I uh, agree entirely with what Councillor Gary Marsh has said. I will start off. I do have a lot of sympathy for those objecting. I spent the first 25 years of my life in Hassocks. I was born and bred. I know the area, and none of us like seeing huge houses built, particularly on fields where we play as children, and that's happened in Hassocks. But also, since 2011, I spent eight years as a Haywards Heath councillor when we did not have a five-year land supply. And I felt the pain of site after site coming forward. We couldn't do anything about it. Sites not large enough to require a proper infrastructure plan, but sites of several hundred houses. And so we had many hundreds of houses going into the low thousands, built particularly around the south of Haywards Heath, without the infrastructure we'd have liked to see. And that was because we did not have a guaranteed five-year land supply. So that is why one reason why I'm keen to see this go through. Um, the other two comments I want to make, obviously, in relation to my portfolio, uh, and just drawing everybody's attention to uh, page 20 on the report, um, and most particular, number 30, is about the location for a science and technology park to the west of Burgess Hill. This is not the only employment site in the DPD that we've put in for the district. We have an ambition in the district to create more jobs. This site has the potential to create 2,500 jobs. Uh, and people who've been involved with the sustainable economic strategy will be aware that it is our desire to create as many jobs in Mid-Sussex as possible so that our residents, many of them, do not have to face the commute and the cost and the impact on the environment and their families' lives of travelling to get jobs and so that they spend their monies, be it lunch monies or whatever it is, within our district. So I think it is very, very important that this goes through, not, and not least because we have started promoting our opportunity in Mid-Sussex, which is a document which is highlighting the advantages of Mid-Sussex to potential employers and inward investors. That is live, that is being warmly received, and obviously we want to make sure that the land is available for these companies when they wish to come and move to Haywards Heath, Burgess Hill, East Grinstead, and wherever else we have significant employment sites. And the final point, Madam Chairman, I wanted to uh, bring everybody's attention to was point 28 on the similar page, which obviously talks about the inspector concluding that the plans, provisions for the protection and enhancement of the environment, etc., are sound. And that is obviously very extremely important to me. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you, Councillor Hillier. Councillor Dempsey. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I feel a bit like I've made the same comments uh, two or three times already about this issue in the, this chamber, um, but I'd like to make them again and particularly perhaps correct some of the things that Councillor Marsh has said. Um, because I think, as, as, as Councillor Cartwright's already alluded to, this process began in the last council before many of us here were elected. And there was a process that was set up, but the final stage of that process took place when the sole representative of the south of the district and the sole non-ruling party representative was not in the room. And it was at that point that SA12 and SA13 were included in the final list of sites to go into this document. Now, when we, after we were elected and when we were first asked to consider this document, we asked at that point not to restart the process, but to take one step back in the process to reconsider that final stage, precisely because we knew how contentious the inclusion of those sites were and the exclusion of other sites. And if we'd done that, we might have had the opportunity to move forward on a cross-party basis, but that opportunity 
was not taken up and that request was denied. We recognise hugely the importance of the five-year housing land supply, which is why we asked to restart that process in that way, in order to make sure we could actually move forward on a cross-party basis, and it could have afforded that opportunity. We made the same request when it came back to council a year or so later, uh, and we were told at that point that we simply had to submit it to the inspector and the inspector would decide, and that it wasn't for us to, uh, to, to, to intervene at that point. And it's back in front of us now and the same issues remain and they were baked in the moment these decisions were made without cross-party or cross-district agreement. Now we're told that we have to take it or leave it. Well, we haven't been afforded the opportunity to represent our residents on this matter and their interests. Council and this process is hidden behind the inspector and we're now at a point where we have, uh, we're, we've been told we have to accept this flawed document, otherwise we might be held ransom by developers. Well, it feels an awful lot like we're being held to ransom by developers already. The process has been flawed, the document is flawed, we can't just accept it, we have to think again. And if I may say also on some of the issues about biodiversity net gain, it is a process, it is a developing process, it's a developing process at national level with national legislation. The tools including the biodiversity metric 3.0 are still in development. There are some major concerns about the ability of de developers to deliver on those mechanisms, including for example, um, promising to deliver biodiversity increase on other sites away from the sites where they're developing without necessarily any guarantee that they're going to be held to those commitments. So I would just caution the amount of trust that's being placed and faith. We hope that system will work. It is a good system in principle, but I think there are significant questions that still remain and we shouldn't place all our faith in it and say that just because that system exists, everything will be okay. We have to think again. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradbury. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Before I start, I, I, I think uh, in, in view of what others have declared, I better declare uh, that I'm the Chairman of West Sussex County Council, just for the record. Um, Chairman, uh, I, I must say, I, I rise to speak with, with a lot of sympathy over, over what's been said about these, about these two sides. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it is uh, with some reluctance that, um, that, that, that I, I know that this Council uh, is moving forward on this. Uh, I've listened carefully to uh, what Councillor Dempsey's just said, and I'll, I'll leave it to um, the leader in it when he winds up to uh, to determine whether he, but Councillor Dempsey says the process has been unsound. I'll leave it to the leader to uh, to to explain uh, whether it is is or isn't unsound. Uh, personally, I believe it is, by the way. But I, I do just want, if I may, to speak. Um, uh, in respect of Councillor Eggleston's amendment, and I, f I fully understand where he's coming from, and I fully understand the, you know, the the the, the anger of uh, uh, members of the public. But we we have heard uh, that this is a binary choice tonight. We either accept the the DPD in its entirety, or we don't accept it. We've also heard from Councillor Salisbury, who is, I think, everyone in this chamber would agree, is very knowledgeable on these matters. Uh, and we have heard uh, his, his explanation that this is just part of setting the, uh, setting the uh, framework that, uh, and any application will still have to go through uh, rigorous planning. Now, Councillor Eggleston says his amendment uh, is necessary because of the letter written by the MP uh, in respect of these sites. I would just... I would just like to, to say, and I do think this is quite important, that I don't think his rationale for a delay is sound. And I say that because adoption of the, uh, uh, of the plan tonight would not stop the Minister from subsequently intervening in, in what planning uh, went forward. As we've, as we've heard, any application would have to go through normal planning process. So I'm a, I'm a, I just want to say that his amendment is not actually correct, or his amendment, not, not his amendment, his rationale behind his amendment I don't think is correct. I don't think that would, his rationale, I don't think that would stop the minister from intervening subsequently. So therefore we, we have heard uh, unequivocally clearly tonight 
that the only way we can protect the whole district, not just certain bits of it, but the only way we can protect the whole district is by adopting this plan or not adopting it. And I would therefore urge all members, including members of the opposition, and I understand their anger, but I would urge them to think very carefully, very carefully about what they're doing if they don't adopt this plan tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bradbury. <laughs> Councillor Ian Gibson, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I confess I'm a little bit confused as to the debate. I thought we were debating deferral, but we seem to be debating the substantive motion, and I will talk to that. Um, firstly, I'd like to echo, echo Councillor Hillier's comments about the Science Park. Um, this is especially welcome at a time when government policies have led to UK researchers being excluded from European research programmes. Um, innovation um, is the cornerstone of the UK economy, and a science park in Mid-Sussex can play an important role. Unfortunately, otherwise the plan is unsound, unnecessary and flawed. It's unsound because it includes site SA22 for 50 dwellings in Crawley Down, even though the criteria set out by the inspector in main modification 21 have not been met. Crawley Down residents demonstrated community cohesion in refusing the significant financial incentives offered by the site promoter and they should be rewarded by the removal of the site. It is unnecessary. Councillors will recall that our meeting in January I presented an analysis which demonstrated that the council could be confident of meeting its district plan housing target without the DPD. The cabinet member responded then with the observation that approving the DPD will reduce the number of dwellings that, need, that will need to be found in the district plan review. But that isn't the role of the DPD. And a large oversupply makes no sense when the council does not yet have a housing target for the review. It's flawed. The inspector is careless with his arithmetic throughout the report. It's his figure of 5.5% for the size of the oversupply on page 39, which offends most. The figure is misleading. He has failed to take account of completions to date, and the true figure for the oversupply is around 14%. So the plan we are being asked to approve is unsound, unnecessary, and flawed. But I won't be voting against it for those reasons. I will be voting against this plan because it does nothing to make this district a desirable place to live, work, and visit. Nothing to improve the quality of life for all now and in the future. And those aren't my words. They're taken from the vision statement in the district plan. The truth is that approving the DPD will reduce the quality of life for all Mid-Sussex residents. It will mean a reduced chance of getting a place in a nearby school, increased traffic congestion, a longer wait to see a doctor. The DPD won't provide the affordable homes that we want for our children and grandchildren. It won't provide homes for the 120 families currently in temporary accommodation. It won't help our journey to net zero. Homes will be being built on green fields and trees will be cut down to make way for them. You don't need to be an independent councillor to vote against this plan. You just need to have the well-being of Mid-Sussex residents at heart. And I will be asking for a named vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Eccleston. Um, may I ask Councillor... Um... Point of order. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, Councillor Ash Edwards, do you wish to speak on the motion by Councillor Eggleston uh, to defer the, or are you talking about the main motion? I think it's still on the amendments, yes. and so I'll speak that's... solely on the amendment, if that's okay. okay. I'll speak later, depending on the outcome of the amendment on the, on yes, the main thank motion. You. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. I, I've listened carefully to, to what has been said by, by members so far on on the process, which is essentially what we're talking about uh, in, in terms of whether we make a decision tonight or whether we um, defer. And firstly, I bring good news uh, for uh, Councillor Edwiston, um, because if he turns to, if members want to turn to page 35 uh, of um, our papers,
sorry, 25. My apologies. We should have a page that looks like this. And it very clearly states that it's a report to Mid Sussex District Council by Mike Fox, an inspector appointed by the Secretary of State. And so the Secretary of State has already had a look at this plan in the name of the independent planning inspector that was appointed to examine it. And so it's hard to see what different view the Secretary of State uh, would take, given that there has been uh, a, an independent public examination process, which is what we're meant to be considering uh, this evening. And I think we've heard um, from members um, that they are opposed to the plan and, and indeed to particular sites in it. That's their right, perfectly entitled to, to do so. But it doesn't strike me that they have a hugely open mind, Chair. Uh, and so if the Secretary of State writes back and says, well, actually, you've got my report here, are we going to have a different debate in due course? It doesn't feel like we are. And so actually, I think our role, Chairman, tonight, and the 2004 legislation makes it very clear, is that we decide the report that's in front of us. A couple of members have talked about process. Councillor Cartwright uh, the importance of due process. Councillor Dempsey said the process isn't uh, sound. Again, they're entitled to their opinions. But I'd, again, just refer uh, Council to the inspector's uh, report, um, where he says at paragraph 329, he gives a very clear assessment of legal compliance and soundness, and states very clearly that the plan complies with the relevant legal requirements, it complies uh, with all of the issues around the local development scheme, the statement of community involvement, sustainability appraisal, habitats regulations, and so on. And so the inspector doesn't agree that the process isn't sound. And again, we need to take account of that. And so I think, Chairman, we should oppose the amendment to defer. We should get on and debate the issues tonight and make a decision tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ash Edwards. Um, I have uh, Councillor Cornish, please, who wish to speak. This is on the deferment we're trying to. Uh, I wanted to speak on the main motion. Right. If that's okay. Would you like to speak after then? Uh, this if, is the amendment. This is, we are trying to discuss the amendment. Yeah, well, if I, if I could speak of course. Uh, uh, on the main point Absolutely. later, that'd be great. Thank you. Not a problem. I have no other speakers who wish to speak on the... Oh, we have some late. Uh, Councillor Henwood, would you like to speak on the deferment? Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. I think the rationale behind uh, Councillor Eccleston's request for an amendment is very reasonable. We have been told we already have a 14% oversupply of houses. To defer, to delay, to have a pause, so that especially we can look at the environmental concerns to do with site allocation 13 would be a wise move. We, we don't have to be rigid. We should be flexible and resilient. We are told this all the time. So I would, I would ask that we approach this from a resilient and flexible point of view to have a pause, to look more thoroughly, especially at the environmental and ecological concerns with site allocation 13. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hampton. Councillor Trumbull. Thank you, Chairman. We have heard from several members this evening that they are concerned about the well-being of residents in Mid Sussex. I am too. Now, we've heard also this evening that a number of members here were not here during a period when this council was subject to planning by appeal. I was. I was one of the members here during the district plan process that we went through 2014 onwards. And during that period, I was on planning meetings then having to look at, assess, and judge, and pass applications that were coming to us because we were planning by appeal. 
I know what the implications of that was for residents in Mid-Sussex. And believe me, it was not in the best interests of the well-being of the residents in Mid-Sussex. Chairman, members, members of the public, we do not want to be there again. Believe me, we do not want to be there again. Questions have been asked about process. Um, I think Councillor Nash Edwards has pointed us to points in this voluminous report that identify that the process has been sound. I don't think we're in a position to question that if somebody has looked at that from the point of view of a planning inspector and said that the process is sound. We may feel that it's been unsound, but the indications are that it has been sound. We've heard also that it has not been cross-party because Councillor Hatton was not here at the final vote for this, uh, this, this process. I'm afraid that is neither here nor there. She was present during the period when the working party was considering this. I know that, and in fact I have heard Councillor Hatton herself say that Councillor uh, Watts Williams, who was managing that process at the time, managed that very well and soundly. So I'm afraid it does not hold water that it was not a good cross-party process. We've heard from Councillor Hatton that she was satisfied with the process. She might not have been there at the end, but I'm afraid that's immaterial. What are we, what are we going to say? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Someone's on holiday in Malaga. We can't have the vote. No, that's not how things work. So, what I, these are all the points that we've been here. What I would like to know, we've heard that we, we have in front of us now a proposal for pausing this, delaying this, deferring this um, uh, site allocation document this evening. We've heard from Councillor Salisbury that we have a choice, a binary choice in front of us by law. We either accept or we do not accept. What we're being presented or asked to consider here is the third option. We defer. I would like to hear from either the leader or Councillor Salisbury, please, what the implications would be on that legal requirement for us to accept or not accept of this third option. Because I do not want us, you do not want us, you do not want us to go back to having, not having a five-year land supply. That is not in the interests of people in this Sussex. Thank you, Chair. Well said. Thank you, Councillor Trumbull. I'm going to go to Councillor Ash Edwards next. Thank you very much, Chairman. Just to, to try and answer <coughs> Councillor Trumbull's uh, question, which I, I think is a, a very important one. Um, and it's a difficult one to answer because the nature of what I think Councillor Eggleston has said is open-ended. It's not time-bound, it's not outcome-bound. Um, and so, unless this council was prepared to come back every month and keep voting until it made a decision, you know, it, it's, very, it's open ended it's very difficult to, to say. If you're deferring it without a, a clear set of things that need to be done, as indeed we've done through the scrutiny committee with the district plan review, here's some things that need to be done and then we'll come back to it. And that's not, I think, um, and I apologise to Councillor Eggleston if I misunderstood what he said, but that's not what I heard him say. It's very difficult to say when, at what point, might the council the come back again. So the, so the consequence is that at some point, the council will lose its five-year housing land supply. And the consequence of that is a developer-led free-for-all across the whole district, not just one or two sites, across the whole district. And as Councillor Trumbull said, that is never in the interests of our community. We've been there before. 
3,000 houses got approved on appeal on greenfield sites that cost the taxpayer three quarters of a million pounds. Houses built where the community didn't want them, where we had limited control over infrastructure and a significant cost to the taxpayer. We do not want to go there again. That is the route we would be set down if the council votes to defer. And one final point, Chairman, just while I've got the floor, I should have made earlier. We heard a lot about due process and the importance of due process being um, followed, and I've explained what the inspector's conclusions are on that. What we're being asked to do tonight in this amendment is literally make up our own process, literally throw due process to one side and make up our own process, because the legislation is very clear. The inspector does the examination, reports to the council, and the council has to either approve or reject. And the consequences of rejecting are that we don't have a five-year supply and we have an open free-for-all, which is not in the interest of the entire Thank you. I have some other councillors that wish to speak. Um, I would like it, them to be on the position of the deferment motion before us rather than on the general main motion. So, Councillor Webster, do you wish to speak regarding the deferment? Chairman, I, I, I wish to... Um challenge the calculations that um, Councillor Gibson put forward. So I will speak later or now, whichever you wish. If it's relevant to the deferment, we speak I'll speak now. later, thank we you. Speak later. Okay, Councillor Demir, is this relevant to the deferment? Uh, probably. Possibly <laughs> not. I'll tell you what, we're running out of time. I'll do it later. Okay. Um, what I have Clive Leband. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'll be very brief. Um, count, my understanding of Councillor Eccleston's motion um, is that we pause um, approval of this DPD, which would protect and um, under <sighs> protect our neighbourhood plan sorry, our district plan and five-year land supply. Um, the Secretary of State has already read it. So in essence, Councillor Eccleston's motion is actually asking us or asking or allowing the Secretary of State time to actually change his mind. It's that simple. And if he changes his mind, having received our, our Member of Parliament's um, letter, then so be it. But if we approve it tonight on the original motion, that will still happen. Therefore, and if that does um, happen, SA12 and SA13 could be removed, but they would have been removed by the Secretary of State. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Leban. Um, Councillor Walker, do you wish to speak on the deferment? Please go ahead. How do I do it? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Much has been made by the opposition tonight of the fact that Councillor Hatton's absence from that scrutiny committee meeting. I chaired that meeting. Councillor Hatton's views were made to me, and I was at pains to ask the officers to confirm that they'd taken their views into consideration. I'd like to make that clear. I would also like to endorse what Councillor Trumbull said. I was one of the ones who suffered, particularly in Crawley Down by overdevelopment that we couldn't stop. And it's the last thing I would ever want to wish on the good people of mid -Sussex. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so, um, Councillor Eggleston, I was going to go next to um, your second uh, Councillor Bennett. Um, would you wish to speak before her? Otherwise, I would give you the opportunity after she has spoken. Uh, no, I'll wait. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Bennett, as seconder, would you like to put forward your deferment motion? Support it. Um, thank you, Chairman. I've listened with interest to the views that have been shared while we've been debating Councillor Eggleston's proposal that we defer. Um, and the views that have been shared have uh, differed, uh, most notably within the Conservative group. Uh, first of all, could I ask the monist, monitoring officer to confirm whether we are allowed to defer tonight or not? Because that has been questioned by Councillor Marshall. 
As has been said, it's a decision, yes or no, but you could make that decision at a later time, so deferral is possible tonight. Thank you, Mr Clark. I appreciate that. So, it is possible to defer. Um, then Councillor Bradbury said that the Secretary of State can intervene, should he so wish, but then Councillor Ash Edwards said that the Secretary of State has already read it and wouldn't intervene anyway. And so it really begs the question, what was being sought to be achieved when the MP promised residents that she would get SA12 and SA13 taken out? And what she was seeking to achieve by publishing that letter to the Secretary of State today on her website. Um, in terms of due process, there is a difference between the planning process being sound and the rules being followed, and the perception amongst residents and amongst all members that the political and democratic process has been sound. It needs to be perceived to be sound too. And I suspect that if there had been a consensus in this room of that, that process had been followed properly, then that perception would be so much stronger and you wouldn't be in this mess that you're in this evening. When we were, elect when we were first elected, and this came to council in September 2019, initially I talked about the Nolan principles and how we'd failed to follow them. And I would close by repeating that the issue here is that one of the Nolan principles, the requirement to be open, hasn't been sufficiently followed. And that is why there is so much unhappiness from residents about what's on the table tonight. And so finally, I would urge members to give the MP a chance to lobby the Secretary of State and for him to consider whether SA12 and SA13 remain in because I strongly suspect that by voting to approve the DPD tonight, that gate is shut and that possibility will not happen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go now to Council Eggleston. Could you actually reconfirm your actual deferment, your wording of your deferment, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, so the, the wording is obviously to delete items one to three and replace it with defer the adoption of the site allocations development plan document to allow the secretary of state for leveling up housing and communities to reconsider the inclusion of sa12 and sa13 in the plan document as requested by the mp for mid sussex on the 29th of june 2022. Thank you, Chairman. And I would just stress that if we pass this tonight, the site allocation DPD becomes a binding document and we will lose that opportunity. Uh, so we should afford the Secretary of State the opportunity to reconsider. Thank you, Councillor Eggleston. Before we go on to um, vote on the your deferment motion. I'm going to ask Councillor Salisbury as the proposer of the original motion to speak. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I, I just wanted to point out to Councillor Bennett that actually she's putting words into Councillor Ash Edwards' mouth. He did not say the Secretary of State um, would, would reject this. He said that it was a Secretary of State's document and therefore it would be a difficult position. So, you know, you shouldn't be saying things that other people haven't said. As for the letter, can I just point out that if this document is deemed to be a, a Secretary of State uh, approved document because it's been, um, it's been his inspector who has, who has uh, examined it, and therefore one would expect the Secretary of State I mean, I don't know, I'm not putting words into his mouth either. I'm just saying what I would expect the Secretary of State to be doing was looking at his inspectors. When we get appeals and the, and the sites are pulled by the Secretary of State, how does he deal with it? He doesn't get somebody in his office to do it. He gives it to an, an independent inspector on his behalf. So he has given this to Mr Fox on his behalf. Um, 
I applaud our local MP for trying to assist um, uh, the residents on these two sites. But I just wanted to point out that in the letter, the things she refers to, harm to this South Downs National Park is covered by the inspector in paragraph 140. The loss of Greenfield is covered by the inspector in paragraph 141 to 144. Coalescence with Burgess Hill is covered, uh, with, with the villagers from Burgess Hill, is covered in paragraphs 132 to 134. So I don't know how you would send this uh, information to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of State then appoints an inspector to examine an inspector's report. I find that really confusing and I, I, I will await to see what the Secretary of State does say uh, in, in reply to this. But I, personally, um, I think that uh, this is something that gets dealt with outside of the approval of, uh, of the DPD tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bennett, is it a point of order? I'm a... Thank you. Please proceed then. Thank you, Chairman. Is it possible to ask the monitoring officer to clarify whether if the DPD is passed tonight, then it's a fixed and final and sort of sealed document, or whether it can still be changed when it goes to the Secretary of State? Councillor, uh, Mr Clark. The Secretary of State does have calling powers, but as has been said, it has effectively been through the Secretary of State already. Um, if the Council does adopt it tonight, it's always open to someone to judicially review it. So it, it's not set in stone, um, but it will have been passed by this Council. So we're now going to move to the vote on Council Eggerson's uh, motion to defer the decision this evening. So would you all vote now, please? Yes, the, the uh, amendment has been lost. Um, there were 18 votes in favour, 25 against, and no abstentions. So now we're going to move back to the substantive motion, which was proposed by Councillor Salisbury. Do I have any other councillors that wish to speak on the substantive motion before us this evening? in front of me not I'm trying to clear it clear it so a hiccup please we can't see the speaker councillor marsh now we go to what we we're here for either pass it or refuse it. But I'll leave you with three, three things that I've written down during that debate. Well, actually, four. Um, I don't like my name being taken in, in vain. Councillor Hatton was the only opposition member in the council at the time, and she was put on the uh, working... Well, she was asked to go on the working group, which she did. Right. 
Mid Sussex District Council, as it stands today, is the only district and borough in the whole of West Sussex that has got a five year land supply. No other district or borough has. I have some very good friends who happen to be in Horsham. They are petrified of the thousands upon thousands of houses that are coming their way because they can't defend it. And they're going to pay tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, trying to defend that. We're not in that position at this time. But if this doesn't get passed today, we could be. In Hurst Pierpoint, I know it's gone. We had two planning applications. One was for a permission and one was a refusal. The Secretary of State saw fit to change that around. He decided, with his total powers that he's got, he changed permission to refusal and refusal to permission. So don't think that just because we're voting today that he hasn't got the power to do that. The Secretary of State can call in any application he feels whether it's got permission or it's got a refusal, ask anybody from um, Crawley Town, because that actually happened as well. The trouble is, I don't want to go on about it, you weren't here when we went through the pain, you sniped at the edges in the press all the time, but you weren't here suffering the pain that we had to suffer because we didn't have a five-year land supply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right? It's very well coming in, oh, yes, look, we're the new brush, we'll do this, we'll do that. You weren't here. You weren't representing your public because the public didn't like you to represent them. They called us to do it. And we had to take those difficult decisions at that time. And I really, really haven't been an ex-portfolio holder, as was Councillor Webster, and I mentioned Councillor McNaughton, and now currently Councillor Salisbury. This is one of the worst portfolios you could have because you are the target all the time. I defended this district against untold harm from other districts who wanted us to take all their housing because they didn't want to do it themselves. Well, we didn't take that then, and we suffered as a consequence because we set what we thought was needed for Mid-Sussex, but the planning inspector decided that we had to take a lot of others because we're in a common housing market with Horsham and Crawley. Crawley pleaded poverty. They couldn't put any houses up. Horsham said, well, we'll do some. Mid-Sussex, you can take the rest. We couldn't fight that because we didn't have a five-year land supply. But we have got one now, so I urge you all to vote for it because, as I said before, if you vote against this and we don't have a five-year land supply, the public will, will actually take the revenge on you. Please don't do that. Thank you. Councillor Cornish. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think it's fair to say that this work is obviously not underestimated and we appreciate that those involved have obviously worked tirelessly to create this five-year housing supply in Mid-Sussex, which is obviously something which is clearly necessary. Um, tonight's vote is binary, it's yes or no to the whole document and the arguments for or against particular sites in the, DBT, in the DPD cannot be heard this evening. But that binary yes or no decision for the Green and the Independent Group, predominantly of Burgess Hill, is, to say the least, extremely difficult. Our group are completely supportive of having the five-year housing plan, sorry, housing supply plan, but please appreciate the difficulty that we have in agreeing with this plan it's in, in its entirety. This plan's been worked through without the involvement of many of us in the room, as Councillor Marsh writes, rightly points out, many of us were elected in in 2019 and weren't involved in that process. Thank you for clarifying that. Where delicate green space and precious ancient biodiversity are at risk, we are left in the precarious position of considering to vote on several areas to be developed, namely SA12, SA13 and SA15, that will have a profoundly detrimental effect on the well-being of people and the environment in Burgess Hill. Now, I appreciate everything that's been said about we're either in or out, but we're faced with the, the sad prospect that the inspector has found that significant and strong arguments raised against development for these contentious sites are to be overruled and the sites are now deemed suitable for development. That's contrary to the feelings <clears throat> Excuse me. That's contrary to the feelings of many people in Burgess Hill, the SoFlag group, 
Burgess Hill Town Council, and now Mims Davis. Unfortunately, several years too late on that one. We've seen recently that it is possible for a future development site to be deselected at the request of the council. Cooksty, for example, where I quote, the objective was to reduce the pressure on greenfield sites in our district. We as a group ref regret that similar empathy and consideration was not shown by the council to the sites at many other earlier opportunities to do so. Although we realise the critical importance of having a five-year housing supply <coughs> plan, we cannot support the plan while it includes the development of these precious greenfield sites for the future generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Cornish. <coughs> Councillor Judy Llewellyn Burke, please. Thank you, Chairman. There's been a lot of talk about when people were elected and what, what the journey has been for them. Um, I was elected in 2017, which was midterm, and this process is a journey and it's ongoing. In my ward, uh, which is Bolney, and I'm privileged enough to be able to serve the residents there, who incorporate a number of villages, and within those villages are employment sites. Um, and they're all included within the documentations, and those employment sites must be thriving. They have to thrive. We all would like to see people have local employment, their environmental and social benefits and economic ben benefits to that happening. Um, and uh, th that has already been covered by uh, Councillor Hillier. Uh, however, there's one um, aspect that is uh, a consequence of all of this and is, is always raised with me by the residents and businesses, which is the fact that we do have a limited um, infrastructure network, we do have limited roads, and whilst people are very keen um, to uh, have the employment uh, possibilities near them, we're unable in some areas to be able to put a place and connectivity programme in, like we have in Burgess Hill. In the rural areas, that doesn't work. And, and I wondered whether Councillor Salisbury um, could really explain to members of the general public um, and councillors here who are um, perhaps new in 2019, um, and it's a slight red herring I do appreciate um, from the document, um, a, a bit about um, the infrastructure and roads so that people have a greater understanding. Because this, is, this whole journey is essential to us. It's essential that we have the district plan in place uh, and that we have our land supply protected. Um, and, but it is very, very complicated. Um, so I wonder whether that's possible, please, um, briefly. Councillor Silvers, do you wish to briefly answer that? We have a lot of speakers, but if you'd like to just <laughs> briefly. <laughs> yes, I'm going to go and see an ENT man and get my throat fixed. <laughs> um, yes, th thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, the, the group that um, we use to do transport modelling uh, is Sistra. Um, and in the report, you'll find that the inspector uh, found that the work they did and uh, that contributed to the Mid-Sussex Transport uh, uh, Plan assessment um, was sound. So they'd had a careful look. West Sussex Highways had approved that system, uh, as indeed had uh, Highways England. Um, and I believe Surrey was involved in, uh, in looking at that as well. So the way that system works is that they... They start off with, with no sites in, and then they add the sites in, and they look at the traffic flows. Now, I know there's a lot of doubt by people sometimes that, you know, this doesn't work. I, I tell you what, I've said this in the chamber before, you know, I, I, am, I have been in the past so focused on some of the issues that on one site I actually went out and sat there at 7 o'clock in the morning to watch the traffic coming out, ticking the cars off. Uh, and then in the afternoon I sat there again ticking the cars in to check um, this tricks uh, assessment that they do. And I was really annoyed, you know, it was accurate. <laughs> I was determined to prove that this system didn't work, but it does. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily recommend that everyone goes and sits outside the gates of development to, to have a look at it, but uh, I was surprised that it was that, that accurate. They put the sites in and they watch the, the, the model flow. And then they take individual sites out and then put them back and take another site out to check the flows there as well. So they do have some pretty accurate data on where the, um, where, where the strengths and, and the weaknesses of the system are. And, and you'll notice in this report, uh, they identified nine uh, 
um, as, uh, junctions that were going to be under strain because of some of the development, particularly around Inverhorn. Um, but with, that's why the inspector has said, with the mitigation that's going in, and highways are going to have to do some work uh, around that site to do that. And then he also focused in on the Fellbridge Junction, the A264, A22. Uh, the model also ran the A272, which is an area of concern for you. So they are watching, as these sites come forward, um, they do watch very carefully what the impact will be. Uh, and this one is the one that's live currently, and you've seen that they've said that with the mitigation around uh, one of the sites, those nine come <coughs> down to only one uh, junction that's under stress. And as we move forward to the district plan review, where the A272 is going to be a major focus, uh, we will see the results of that as and when uh, th that model is run for those. So I hope that's some satisfaction. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Salisbury. Councillor Eaves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I would just uh, like to say, regarding what Councillor Salisbury just said, that we had a planning training session recently, and I asked the highwayman, have you ever actually managed to stop something on grounds of it being severe traffic, um, detrimental to traffic? And he said, no, only once, and we were overruled. So I don't trust the view you know, of highways. I really think you can't rely on them to say no. And that brings me to my point, which is paragraph 317 of the main modifications. If you bear in mind that if we vote this through tonight, 78% of these dwellings will be in Burgess Hill and there will be gridlock. And bear in mind today that the Climate Change Committee also told the government that it would be missing its zero carbon targets by 60%. So we must realize that we need more ambition in this council on modal shift and we're just not showing it which is what i'm talking about now is sa 37 the cycle path between burgess hill and haywards heath why is there no time scale attached to that the inspector in the main modifications para 317 says a central route appears not to have been progressed can anybody tell me why not please and why is there no time scale thank you Thank you. Councillor Hedwood. Oh, oh. oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I wish to address these remarks particularly to Councillor Salisbury. Uh, we discussed on my, Monday night at Burgess Hill Town Council Planning Committee the application put forward by the developers to ask for a streaming, streaming consideration of SA13. In other words, they appear to want to avoid putting in an environmental impact assessment. So I would like assurance from the cabinet, from everybody, that you will make sure that site allocation 13 has a full environmental impact assessment. I would also like assurance that this is done before the developers move on to the site. This is a very precious area, unique in flora and fauna. As our public speaker has said previously, bats, badgers, I think there's 11 species of vegetation which is on the red list, birds. So that's all I'm asking if this goes forward, if we can make sure that we, Im we impl implement our policies, DP 37 and DP 38 on biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councillor Salisbury, do you wish to respond to Councillor Henwood? I haven't been going to sit back here in tea, man. Um, thank you, Councillor. I, I can't give you that assurance because we have a process. Um, and the process is that to um, do an environmental assessment, um, we as the local planning authority uh, decide whether the land fits the requirements of an environmental assessment. Um, now, that there is a, a specified uh, requirement that the, the land has to meet for that to be required. So what do we do? So we, you know, we've had a significant number of representations in respect to the screening request. But the screening process is a procedure used by local planning authorities to determine whether the proposed development is likely to have significant effects on the environment in the context of the EIA regulations. 
There is no formal requirement to undertake consultation or take into account the views of third parties in respect of this process, because it's a straightforward, does the land fit the requirements uh, to put forward a, 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 an environmental uh, statement. In adopting the position that the proposed development will not have likely significant effects on the environment, and any subsequent application will not require the support of an environmental statement, that does not mean that potential impacts will not be considered as part of any subsequent planning application. To support any subsequent planning application, the applicant will need to submit a range of technical reports as required by our own validation list, which will include a full ecological assessment of the site, habitats and protected species, to en enable an assessment of the development's impact on the biodiversity value of the site. The fact that the development is not considered to require an environment statement does not diminish the importance or the weight afforded to such matters subsequently at the application stage. So it will get that, um, that focus, um, but without a report that it doesn't fit the, the requirements of, if you, if you follow me. Thank you, Councillor Salisbury. Excuse me, would you mind not interrupting the meeting? Thank you. Councillor Belsey. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I know we all acknowledge the document before us um, book tonight is the result of four years of hard work um, following the initial call for sites back in 2018. And this has resulted in the report from the inspector at the planning inspectorate where he concludes that the site's DPD is compliant with all legal requirements and is sound and is capable of adoption. Not to adopt the DPD would mean the council would not be able to demonstrate it is meeting its housing requirements in full and increase the risk of not being able to demonstrate a five-year land supply, leading in all likelihood to speculative development where the council loses control of its ability to determine potential appropriate planning sites. Additionally, given where we are already in the plan making process, some sites will be difficult to defend now should the developers bring forward a planning application. By adopting the plan, it will make it easier to secure mitigation and infrastructure in the future, which we won't be able to do without adopting the plan. Concerns are clear from residents tonight, but in respect of a number of sites, particularly around Burgess Hill and East Grinstead, I've received many emails myself, particularly in respect to the East Grinstead sites. And living in that locality, I see daily the concerns brought up by residents regarding traffic and infrastructure, also by the impact of the environment, a common theme in respect of all sites, including, as we've just heard, those of SA12 and SA13. Thank you to everyone for taking the time to comment uh, to me on this matter. But a number of the emails asked me not to support tonight the approval of concreting over these various sites and to oppose the developments as they bring no benefits to Mid-Sussex. I think some residents believe that these are the equivalent, by adopting the plan, that this is the equivalent of a planning application, but they're not, and detailed planning applications will come forward with appropriate environmental, ecological assessments, etc. As an example, should the Emberhorn Lane application for 500 homes come forward as mitigations, uh, for those that say there'll be no benefits, it would need early years and primary school provision, children's play space and open space, a strategic suitable alternative near, nearby green space of 40 acres, a minimum of 142 dwellings for older people. It must address the demand for further GP provision. It must protect the rural setting of Gullage and work within the landscape. And critically, it must satisfy Surrey and West Sussex County Council how to mitigate development impacts and contribute to traffic improvements. Now, as a town councillor, sitting on East Quincy Town Council Planning Committee, I would expect a planning application to address all of those items in detail. And if it doesn't, I wouldn't expect to support it as a planning application. In looking at the planning application, we could seek to include, for example, the Grampian conditions that have been mentioned, if appropriate, to do so. And I'm sure that many of the other councillors who sit on planning committees feel the same in respect to planning applications which come forward. We need to achieve these mitigations or I expect they shouldn't be approved by our own council planning process. 
I fully understand the concerns raised by residents and the passion with which they're making them, but I feel it is important that we adopt the DPD tonight to secure our five-year land supply and to ensure and to prevent unplanned development. And then we must look to planning applications today come forward and subject them to the most robust of scrutiny. If we don't do this, as is made clear in the report, it will make it very difficult to recommend potential refusal, refusal of future planning applications and thus result in the worst of all possible worlds, which I wouldn't be able to support. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Belsey. Um, Councillor Webster. Thank you, Chairman. I, I first of all um, would like to say that I have listened very carefully to everything that everybody has said this evening and there have been good points made by um, people on um, all sides of the argument um, and I, I think Councillor Belsey has addressed many of the concerns that I hold as an East Grinstead member and I have had 35 emails um, asking me to vote against this document and I have had one asking me to vote in favour of it. Um, and I, I, I've, I've heard people say on several occasions, we don't want to be there again. And no, we certainly don't. Because I, I remember a specific application that came before us for a redundant um, piece of ground in East Grinstead where there is now a block of apartments and we had nowhere to go with that we had to vote for it otherwise the developer had given us notice that he would appeal if we refused it and we had no five-year housing land supply so we approved his application and we fought very hard for highway improvements and what we ended up with was that the two sets of traffic lights at the Star Junction and Imberhorn Lane were actually, would you believe it, they were coordinated to work together, which previously they hadn't. Okay? So that Im Im improved the traffic flow through that area very significantly. So um, it is possible to put in mitigations for uh, and infrastructure improvements um, and um, I, I, I think that my, my point about raising a challenge to Councillor Gibson's calculations he has very kindly um, passed me a note which I, I will try to decipher um, <laughs> but what, what remains for me is that if he, as he contends, there is an oversupply of homes in our planning process, why do we have almost 2,000 families tonight who are on a housing waiting list? And we have more than 60 families who are in emergency accommodation outside of their communities. They are being put into emergency accommodation in all sorts of places. I, I, I also want to commend the, 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 the child who came into this chamber and faced us all down with her father for support to ask her question. And I, I agree with her concerns. And SOFLAG have been on a long journey with this council over all the years that I've been a councillor. And we, we are in a position where we are damned if we do and damned if we don't. And the professional advice that I have looked at very, very carefully is that we need to agree this document. And I'm afraid that is what I will be doing tonight. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Webster. Councillor Swetman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there's been a very good debate tonight, and 
I think Councillor Salisbury, the uh, planning um, portfolio holder, has actually summed it up. And I think members need to listen to what he's been saying tonight, amongst others. Um, speaking as well for East Grinstead, again, I have also had a lot of emails today. <coughs> you know, some of them a little bit slightly threatening that if I don't vote for this, they never vote for me again. Well, I don't operate like that personally. I always try and do the right thing. But I can sympathise with the residents of East Grinstead, especially on the traffic implications, especially on the area of the A22 and the Fellbridge Junction. This also affects me as a resident of East Grinstead that travels that road fairly frequently. And it is very frustrating. However, the DPD has been through a multi-year robust process, which the inspector has deemed to be um, sound. And funny enough, he did not raise the traffic in East Grinstead as a major concern. Yes, some people might think, you know, that, that is a concern. Well, I think we all know there is traffic issues there, but when the inspector says there's no concern, we have to go with him. If we do not approve this, it will affect our five-year housing land supply, which could lead to unwanted speculative development. And that is what we do not need to see. And as what has been said, if we lose that five-year housing land supply, we've been there before when we didn't have a five-year housing land supply. It is essential. If we don't have that, then be careful what you wish for. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Sweatman. Councillor Ian Gibson. Thank you, Ozzy and Mia. Revert, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, three points that I'd like to pick up on. Um, uh, the, the first is um, the traffic modelling uh, that was done. Um, I have looked into this in great detail with the SISTRA model. I have no issues with the SISTRA model at all. What I have in, an issue with is the base case data that was used. And the problem with that is that the original plan, right, the district plan at the time that it was prepared, the transport model within it was done to a base case data of 2008 in East Grinstead. When we came to do the DPD, that was too old to be used. And I've got that confirmation from the highways people who support the planning in West Sussex. And that's why the assessment gives us this very curious result that we can build 750 houses in the Inverhorn Gap round there and have no, it will not have an appreciable adverse impact. So that's the problem I have with that. The next problem I have with it is that it's about cumulative impacts. And at the moment, in that area, we have 350 houses already being built. We don't know where the traffic's going to go. The mitigations have not been put forward. The second point that I have is, yes, I wasn't in this council in 2015, and, and that was probably a good, a good thing. I, my heart goes out to Councillor Hatton in all honesty. Um, <laughs> right? It, uh, but I, I do recall that period. I recall that it was the residents of Crawley Down that were fighting the applications approved by this council. In fact, one of them was approved on the casting vote of the current uh, cabinet member. Yes, I totally agree that that was, that was difficult. Yes, I agree that, um, that, that once you've declared things to be sustainable. And indeed, in my area, there's two major sites which were assessed and not as, as sustainable but not selected in the DPD. And at this very moment, traffic measurements are being measured across the roads in order to look at the access into that. Because as the point has been made by the leader, the developer can just come along and say it's been to be sustainable. The last point I'd like to make is the five-year housing land supply. What do I think about that now? It's interesting. I have always said that this council has done the best possible work in the Northern Arc. Outside the Northern Arc, it's simply chosen from a palette of sites that have been put forward by developers, the sites that developers want to. Now, that, I just wonder what difference does a five-year housing land supply 
make to my residents. They don't see it. They, those sites that the developers want to be built on will be built on. They'll either be built on because this council's decided they can be built on, or else they'll be built on because there's nothing to stop them being built on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Um, councillors, we've had a, a really good debate, and I have four councillors that have indicated they wish to speak. After those four have spoken, I'm then going to pass on to Councillor Ash Edwards, the seconder of the motion. <coughs> so I'm going to ask Clive LeBan, Councillor Clive LeBan, to speak. Um, thank you, Chair. I'll be brief if I can. Um, I note Councillor Cornish's um, dismay at the inclusion of um, SA12 and SA13, and I, I, I do sympathise um, both with the councillors that feel uncomfortable with that um, and also the residents that um, are, are objecting. However, um, D, the B, DPD is, is in effect um, much like a planning application. You don't look at it um, one bit at a time. You're looking at it as a whole on balance um, and this is something that we're trying to consider whether we adopt this for the district and for the benefit of the whole district to deliver and protect our five-year housing land supply. Um, and for that reason, I, on balance, will be supporting the motion to adopt. Um, and as an aside, um, we've touched upon the 27 various elections and members have come forward and are sitting here this evening. Um, there was an election in Haywards Heath at the time and one of the candidates um, in one of the other parties um, in their documentation be, um, chastised a Mid-Sussex District Council at the time in 2017 for not having um, a five-year land supply and for not having a district plan. That was part of their manifesto. Um, we, do have a, we do have one now and I believe looking around the room that most of the members <coughs> want to protect that even with those reservations. And so I do hope that you um, reconsider and on balance support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Band. Councillor Sue Hatton, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, just to put the record straight, as my name's been mentioned several times this evening, um, the programme timescale for a decision on the sites to be selected was extended right at the last minute. So unfortunately, I was on a pre-arranged holiday in Italy in the mountains, not in Malaga. <laughs> it's true, I think, that then Councillor Watts-Williams did do a good job, but he did not retain his position on the council at the elections, nor did Prue Moore, another working party member. So the working group fell into something of disarray. When the district plan came before council, I did vote against it, as I will do again tonight regarding the site selection documents. And my objection to site SA13 is well known, not just on the ecological aspect spoken of tonight, but also because access is onto Ockley Lane, 300 houses added to the huge increase on traffic on Ockley Lane from the 500 homes at Clayton Mills, a road which does have a six foot six width restriction, which Councillor Marsh seems to think I was wrong in saying last time around. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hatton. Um, Councillor Ruth Demir. Thank you. After my full start earlier on, thank that's, you, Madam Chairman. That's quite all right. I'll be very, very brief because everything's been said. In fact, I think somebody said just now, we're damned if we do, we're damned if, I, if we don't. I just wanted, and Councillor Hillier alluded to it, I do, my heart goes out to East Grinstead and Burgess Hill because Haywards Heath has changed out of all proportion. Over the years, we have had thousands of houses and the problem has been very often, we didn't get the benefits. So I will be, will be voting for it, I'm afraid, because I think if we don't, then developers will just carry on regardless. And just one little point, we don't select sites. Developers, landowners put them forward. I think that we should all remember that, that it's other people's, I shouldn't say greed, <coughs> but other people put them forward. So at some point, they're all on that list. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Councillor Rex Whitaker. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, Sites SA 19 and 20 are in my ward, which propose circa 750 houses in North East Grinstead in a very close proximity to each other. Immediately adjacent to these sites are two already chronically trafficly congested junctions. The location of these sites requires the active administration, administrative and legal partnership of Mid-Sussex District Council, Tandridge District Council, Surrey County Council and West Sussex County Council in order to deliver specific junction upgrades to provide mitigation to both existing congestion and planned traffic from the proposed two sites. However, to date, no progress has been made with these four authorities finding a junction solution, let alone deliver one in the future. This council should make a strong written policy commitment now to guarantee delivery of these junctions mitigation as a condition precedent of any planning application process. My question is, will it? Because if it cannot, then I feel this evening I am unable to support its adoption at this time. Thank you. Councillor De Bell, you're the last speaker on this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I think it's quite simple, really. Um, I, I live in East Grinstead and I fully concur with what uh, Councillor Belsey was saying and also with what Councillor Webster was saying. Uh, my uh, <coughs> daughter lives quite close to where one of these developments are going to be taking place or likely to be taking place. Don't forget they've got to go through the planning process in Felbridge. I'm not happy with the number of houses that are, are being built in East Grinstead. I know other councillors, other colleagues of mine are not happy. And I resent the uh, thing coming from the other side of the chamber that we're, we're the ones that are doing this to them. I really resent that. I don't like the extra housing that we're having to put up with. Nobody does, and we do resent it. But I would say this. I remember when I first became a councillor, and a certain sage councillor was coming round with me when we were looking at some planning issues. And he said to me, John, he said, the house that you live in, somebody will have objected to being built in the first place. Now, we know that the population in this country is going through the roof all the time. In fact, if they keep coming across the channel, mm -hmm. I don't know where the heck we're going to live. The fact is that we need houses, unfortunately. And... Whether we're NIMBYs or not, sometimes they are on our doorstep. And coming back to what that gentleman said to me about not being happy with the houses that were being built, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the medieval high street, when that was being built, people were objecting to that. <laughs> now, the fact is that this tonight is not a vote either or. If you vote against this, if we vote against this tonight, that doesn't say that those houses will not be built. What it says is you throw the reins in and then it's all down to the developers and they will take those, they will put those houses in, they will bring them to, to, uh, to planning just the same <coughs> and a lot more. And I particularly <coughs> resent certain people suggesting to, trying to suggest that we're the party, if you like, on this side who want to see more and more housing because it, the, the, the opposite is true. We're the party of community and we are trying to keep a grip on this. So uh, I would suggest that the only way that we can make sure that this is the kind of maximum that we're likely to get over the next five years is to vote for this. And if we don't, we'll get it anyway plus Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor DeVille. I'm now going to go to Councillor Ash Edwards, who seconded the motion. Thank you very much, um, Chairman. Uh, lots to, to respond uh, to uh, in the debate we've had this evening, but I'll, I'll try and be uh, concise in, in wrapping up and, and pulling it all together. And actually, it's a pleasure to follow Councillor DeBell. Um, and I think he's very right in the points that he uh, made. Planning is the most difficult issue for uh, district council planning authorities 
uh, to undertake. It arises strong passions, uh, it is something that everyone has a view on, and we operate in a highly constrained system. Indeed, as I've said before, you know, we don't design the system. Um, we very often disagree with the system. I've certainly argued for changes in the system, as have many people in this room. But the truth is, we have to continually work to deliver what is in the interests of the whole district, not people who live next to one site or the other, as important as those points are, but the district as a whole. And I think tonight is an interesting case study, actually, in how the planning system needs to change. Because actually, uh, as some members have referred to, uh, this process has taken four years. It's had three public consultations. It's had a public examination by an independent planning inspector. But the outcome is one and a half years worth of housing supply. One and a half years. It's taken four years to get one and a half years of housing supply. Yeah, that's got to change as a system. But it does demonstrate the challenges that we have in rural districts like ours. Now, not adopting the plan doesn't mean that the sites in it won't get built. It just means that other people make the decisions for us. We lose control. We get a worse outcome for local communities because we can't rely on the policies and the mitigations in the plan. We all know developers will try and get away with the bare minimum. So I understand that some of these sites aren't welcome to some residents. But the truth is the alternative is worse. And in a district where just 4% is developed, that's us, just 4% of our district is within a built-up area boundary. The truth is greenfield sites will always be part of our planning system. We can wish that might not be the case, but it is the truth. So just to try and respond, Chairman, to some of the points that have been made, um, Councillor Marsh made the point around the challenges of the planning system and indeed the portfolio holders. And I'd like to thank Councillor Salisbury for uh, the work that he's done, and the late Councillor McNaughton uh, for the work that he's done, and indeed Councillor Mark, Councillor Webster, who've all played their part uh, in the planning portfolio over the years it is the most difficult role uh, you can have in a cabinet. Um, but it is important to ensure that we keep our district uh, as protected as we can uh, by having a plan. Uh, and indeed, the advantages of having a plan and securing the maximum you can from development to actually uh, demonstrate in Councillor Marsh's walk in the Peace Potters development, which is an exemplar of getting lots out of developers uh, and planning really great sustainable communities with infrastructure. A number of members, particularly from East Grinstead, have uh, commented on, on the challenges they have uh, in their town and, and the work they're doing to represent residents quite rightly and secure mitigations for indeed what is actually a larger number of houses uh, than, than in Burgess Hill, which I understand a lot of the debate has focused on. And Councillor Whitaker is quite correct in identifying the need for cooperation between the various highways and planning authorities uh, to resolve the really difficult uh, tra traffic and, and highways issues uh, in the East Grinstead area uh, and indeed uh, these sites as part of that. Uh, and hopefully the reassurance I can give is contained within the policies uh, for the East Grinstead sites. Um, on page uh, 174 of our pack, and it's page 60 of the DPD document itself, two numbers. The policy wording for SA20, for example, makes clear that it is a policy requirement if we adopt the plan for working collaboratively, that a planning applicant will have to work collaboratively with and to the satisfaction of both Surrey and West Sussex County Highways authorities mitigate development impacts by maximising sustainable transport enhancements and where additional impacts remain, highway mitigation measures will be considered. So that is the protection in the plan for those issues. And it is quite right through a planning application process that the utmost scrutiny uh, is applied to that uh, to ensure that the very best possible mitigations and outcome 
uh, can be uh, achieved. And, and I think that policy wording uh, is important to help us do that. But I want to just come back, Chairman, to conclude uh, with the points that Councillor de Bell made. It's difficult to say, all members find it difficult to say in debates like these. But here's the truth. We do need new homes. Difficult to say. They're for random people we don't know, but people in our community, people who grow up here and want to stay here, people who want to come and contribute to our economy and to the life of our district. With 2,000 households tonight on a housing waiting list in insecure accommodation who need an affordable home, some of which will be delivered through this DPD. Now, I know that people recognise that. Councillor, what's been said about what people say in public meetings, Councillor Bennett said at a public meeting that she's pro-housing. The Liberal Democrats want a 26% uplift in Mid-Sussex's housing targets. But never, about housing about where you build them? Shut up. But never say where they should go. And if you don't like one site, you should always be honest and propose an alternative site. There have been opportunities for that to happen through the process, and that has never happened. I've looked back at the 2019 amendment, no alternative site was proposed. I've looked at Burgess Hill Town Council's representations, no alternative site was proposed. And so we are left with what the planning inspector considers. And I repeat, Chairman, as I said earlier, the planning inspector, over a very long period of time, has considered all of the points, has considered the representations for and against, has considered all of the evidence, and has come to the conclusion that the plan is sound. And in order to protect our district, protect the important things about our area, the bits we love, we have to have a five-year housing land supply. And that's what we can protect by voting in favour of adopting the plan tonight. And while a lot of focus, understandably, in these debates is on housing, there's also something really important in this document that I think we shouldn't overlook. Councillor Hillier referred to it earlier, and Councillor Wendenberg talked about employment sites really importantly, because this document also provides the policy basis for our science and technology park. If we are serious as a district about ensuring we have high quality, well paid, jobs for the future, so that people don't have to leave our district for work, but can work locally, more sustainably, because they can live, you know, get to work closer. We're serious about growing our economy so people are better off. We need investments like our science and technology park. And it's only by voting for this plan that we get the policy commitment to it, so that can move forward. So Chairman, I would urge the council to vote in favour of the DPD tonight. And I do so respecting the points that people make in opposition and understanding why they make them. But I think in the interest of the district as a whole, we have to protect the whole district by having a plan and voting in favour this evening. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Ash Edwards. I'm now going to move to the vote. The... Uh, Pardon? Have we has one been requested? Councillor. If I can remind you about an hour and a half ago, I did ask I that this be I didn't understand that was a recorded. formal request. I had to. five people, five supporters. We need five people in favour. Okay. Fine. That's fine. <coughs> so we move to a recorded vote. Um, same procedure. Same procedure. Um, I'm going to read the recommendation so for the benefit of the members and viewers and listeners. The full recommendation, which is on page 17, the Council is recommended to, one, adopt the Site Allocation Development Plan document, two, publish the Site Allocation Development Plan documents, sustainability appraisal report and the adoption statement, three, give delegated authority to the divisional unit leader for planning and economy to make typographical and minor factual corrections to the documentation 
as necessary before publication. May I ask you to all vote now. Voting is published on the screen. In favour and 18. Sorry, 20 in favour. 24, 18, and 1. So it's 24 in favour, 18 against, and 1 abstention. The names are on the screen, which will be in the minutes. Thank you very much. So we're moving on to item 8, which is representation representatives on outside bodies as um, laid out on pages 265 to 270 of your agenda. This is, um, item is being proposed by Councillor Ash Edwards. Would you ex I'm They're just leaving. They are just leaving the chamber. I repeat, we're moving on to item eight, representatives of outside bodies, proposed by Councillor Ash Edwards. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I'd like to formally propose uh, that we agree the list outlined in column one of the uh, paper. This, this motion is uh, seconded by Councillor Webster. Do you wish to speak now or to reserve your right? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll reserve my right if anybody does if anybody wish to speak, to speak, Chairman. Anybody wish to speak on this motion? No? no. Okay, Councillor Webster. Chairman, in the interests of brevity, I will not say anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first. Right. So we are going to move to the full recommendation, which is on page... 265, the Council is recommended to approve the nominations to outside bodies listed in paragraph 4 of the report. Please, will members use their microphone touchscreen to vote? Please vote now. Chairman, that's 38 in favour. None against and three abstentions. 39 in favour, none against and three abstentions, so it's carried. Motion is carried. Thank you very much. We're moving on to item nine, is the adoption of modern slavery and human trafficking transparency statement. This item is proposed by Councillor Anthea Lee and refers to pages 271 to 282 on your agenda. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chairman. A change is coming to national leg legislation in the form of the Modern Slavery Act, aiming to prevent modern slavery in all its forms. In October 2020, Mid-Sussex District Council undertook to do everything in its power to become a slavery-free community, pledging to ensure the removal of slave-based labour from its supply chains. In March 2022, this year, 
the Scrutiny Committee for Community Customer Service and Service Delivery reviewed Mid-Sussex a Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Transparency Statement for 22-23 and unanimously agreed it. It's this statement that comes to the Council this evening and therefore I recommend that Council adopt the attached draft Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Transparency Statement for 2022-23. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Webster, do you wish to speak now or reserve your right? Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I would like to just say one thing. And as Councillor Lee has said, this um, policy was put to the Scrutiny Committee. And I would like to thank the members of the Scrutiny, scrutiny Committee for the um, um, way in which they debated the issue and supported unanimously this policy. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. If no member wants you to speak, we, I would go to the recommendation, which is on page 271. The Council is recommended to adopt the attached draft Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Transparency Statement for 2022-2023. All members vote now, please. Favour, Chairman, none against, and no abstentions. So unanimous. Thank you. So that motion is passed. So we're moving on to item 10, which is the MSDC pay policy statement for 22-23, as on pages 283 to 294 of your agenda. This item is proposed by Councillor Ash Edwards. <coughs> I formally propose the uh, recommendations, this, as members will be familiar with, because uh, this is an annual report, uh, is a requirement of the Localism Act uh, that the Council agrees to the pay policy statement uh, at Appendix A. Thank you. Thank you. This item is seconded by Councillor De Meer. Do you wish to speak on this subject? Um, is, there any is there anyone wish to raise any point on this? So, uh, Councillor Hicks. Yes, Chairman, thank you. I'd just like to ask, I'm pleased to, to see the reference to uh, referral back to the Council for severance payments uh, above uh, 100,000. But I'd just like to ask for complete clarification that uh, 100,000 includes all the exit uh, payments for the, uh, any post holder. Uh, I've had some clarification from the business unit leader for HR and payroll, but I'm not... Uh, the, I'm a bit slightly bamboozled, so I, I just want to, to, to check, confirm that, that that would apply to any payment above 100,000, whether it's constituted of specific exit payments or, or statutory requirements. Councillor okay. Shepherds. Chairman, uh, no, and Councillor Hicks is not quite correct. Um, the uh, legislation is very clear um, that contractual payments. Uh, do not count towards uh, that threshold. Um, and that's made very clear uh, in the uh, guidance published on the 12th of May by the department entitled Statutory Guidance on the Making and Disclosure of Special Severance Payments by Local Authorities uh, in England. Uh, and so it is discretionary payments uh, that are key. Thank you. Councillor Hicks. Um, I'd just like to, I'm just a bit concerned. I, I think it's still open in the gift of the council to uh, have a limit of 100,000 on payments, however they're made up, if it includes some discretionary payments. Um, so I wonder if the, the leader would consider uh, amending the policy, given the, the substantial amount that uh, is, is, would be involved in, in making a payment of 100,000. And if there were discretionary payments within that, I think there would be concern from the many councillors 
in terms of how that has been arrived at. Councillor <coughs> Rasher, please. Thank you, Chairman. I think we should stick to the legal position uh, in law and in the statutory guidance. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jamia. Thank you, um, Well, uh, as you know, our pay policy is a legal requirement under the Localism Act 2011 and gives the levels, elements of remuneration for our chief officers and senior staff. Um, as noted in the paper, this reflects our current practice and introduces nothing new. It's an annual one. Also, as noted, all the remuneration data is published on our website for transparency. Um, I'd also advise members that pay scales, of course, are set nationally by agreement, so not within the council's remit. I do recommend this policy to members. Thank you, Councillor Tamir. I'm now going to proceed to the full recommendation on page 283. Council members are recommended to agree the pay policy at Appendix A to comply with the requirements of the Localism Act. Could all members vote now, please? Chairman, that's uh, 35 in favour, 8 against, so the motion is carried. Thank you very much. So I'm now moving on to item 11, the Scrutiny Committee Responsibilities for 22-23, um, as detailed on pages 295 to 298 of your agenda. This item is proposed by Councillor Webster. Thank you, Chairman. I'm proposing the item in light of the agreed portfolio changes and to ensure clarity, this paper is being brought to Council and it's accompanied by the list of Cabinet portfolios as recorded in the Council Constitution. Paragraphs 4 to 6 of the report provide specific detail as to what will be included in the responsibilities of each of the three scrutiny committees. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. This item is uh, seconded by Councillor Ash Edwards. Do you wish to speak now, Councillor Ash Edwards? Thank you. Thank you. Does any member wish to speak on this? I can see Councillor Chapman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do regret that um, the portfolio is going to various committees and not being categorised. I myself are on the community scrutiny because I'm interested in sport and leisure, but sport and leisure is now being split due to Councillor Belty's promotion to deputy leader, so his part of leisure is going to one committee, and then uh, Councillor Demir for leisure centres is staying at another committee, so you want like, your aces in places, as it were, to have good scrutiny. I fear you're going to start having more tactical substitutions coming in. I mean, it's already crept in already, but um, so it's difficult if you, like me, you like leisure, or say you like housing, housing split between two committees, you might not get the most effective scrutiny and take advantage of uh, members' skills the way it's being split. Okay. Um, I haven't got a proposal to change that because I'm just no. mere one person, but I just wanted to state that. Okay, your thank comments you. have been noted and thank you. Um, I also have Mr. Uh, Councillor Paul Brown. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to uh, ask a few questions, if I may. Um, I, point two, uh, it refers to the committee, but I guess this, this motion is to, the, to this council. Um, and turning to point five, um, it, it states uh, it's proposed the Scrutiny Committee for Planning Economic Growth and Net Zero will ensure policy in, uh, I add, the draft district plan is energetically implemented. Can I have an assurance that this Scrutiny Committee will henceforth actually meet as planned and the agreed working party will be constituted with its terms of reference and will meet 
without further procrastination. And my third question relates to paragraph eight. Uh, other options considered. An area for improvement in, in the report by the head of regulatory services is the setting out of alternative options and options considered and rejected in reports to council. Now, these are not my words, but those are the words of Sandra Prail, who carried out a council governance review at the beginning of 2021. And... Uh, her high priority recommendation, R3, stated the council should consider the areas for improvement in order to review its governance arrangements for scrutiny, council and working groups. So my question then is, has Sandra Prale's council governance review been considered? And if so, why is it not mentioned under other options considered in paragraph eight. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Brown. Councillor Webster, do you wish to respond? Uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that the work plan dictates how often meetings occur, and um, it's also um, in, in agreement between officers and the, the chairman of the committee. And in terms of the other options considered, um, it says quite clearly there that um, the, the scrutiny, scrutiny committees with a wider number of staff need, need to be at any particular meeting. So, y yes, I do believe that the report that was commissioned has been considered as part of this process. Thank you, Councillor Webster. Thank you. Councillor Ash Edwards, do you wish to second of this motion? Speak. Chair, the theme might have an indication from Councillor Marsh. I'm sorry, Councillor Marsh. Sorry, just very quickly. Councillor Chapman said he, he's torn in two, two places. Nothing to stop him attending that scrutiny committee and have his views. He just won't be able to vote on that committee. That's all. Thank you, Chairman. That's true. Thank you. I apologise that I missed you. I was late, late for the <laughs> was... Thank you, yeah, Councillor Marsh is, is absolutely correct on, on that. And, and just to pick up the other point that Councillor Brown raised uh, around meeting workloads, I, I hope one of the uh, outcomes of this, and I think Mr Clark has looked at the, the workload, um, is actually to ensure we have a slightly better distribution of workload between the committees so that we don't have some committees with bigger agendas and some... Uh, with, with less so. Uh, Chairman, I think this is a sensible way of just realigning uh, the portfolios uh, to the committee so that we can ensure uh, strong and effective scrutiny of the relevant cabinet portfolios uh, in each committee. I'm going to go um, to the vote. I've been asked to uh, state the recommendations for the benefit of members and viewers and listeners. The full recommendation is on page 295. The committee is recommended to agree one three scrutiny committees entitled one scrutiny committee to, for leader, deputy leader and housing and customer services dealing with the work carried out by the leader, deputy leader and cabinet member for housing and customer services, two scrutiny committee for planning, economic growth and net zero to shadow the work of the cabinet member for planning and the cabinet member for economic growth and net zero and Three, the Scrutiny Committee for Community, Leisure and Parking to shadow the work of the Cabinet Member for Community and the Cabinet Member for Leisure and Parking. Item two, three committee, the three committees will meet at 7pm in the Council Chamber unless otherwise agreed by the relevant committee chairman. Would you all vote now? Chairman, that's um, 
39 in favour, two against, and two abstentions. So it's carried. Thank you very much. We're moving on to item 12, which is recommendations from Cabinet held on the 6th of June 2022, pages 299 to 300. Uh, the financial outturn of 2021-2022. This is proposed by Councillor Ash Edwards. Thank you, Chairman. I formally propose the, the Cabinet recommendations um, for the budget management and the uh, capital programme okay. uh, update. Thank you. Is there any um, councillor wish to speak on this? Otherwise, I should go to the seconder, Councillor Belsey. I see no one, so I'm going to pass on to Councillor Belsey as a seconder of this motion. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'm very pleased to second these recommendations. Just, just to highlight, uh, it was nice to see that three uh, additional uh, projects added to the capital programme in our three towns, um, importantly to bring uh, some temporary accommodation into East Grinstead, uh, which will make a big improvement uh, on Swan Mead and that, Queen's, and that part of Queen's Road, uh, to, uh, to finalise the arrangements for the improvements of toilets, the Orchard Shopping Centre, and to do the important work that's needed uh, in Beadlands, in Burgess Hill. And so I'm very pleased uh, to second these recommendations. Thank you. Right. Um, we've got, is it one vote? Um, one vote. So the recommendations that are before you. So um, as tabled, so we have one vote for this item. Um, so, it, could I ask you all to vote now, please? Chairman, that's um, 42 in favour, none against, and one abstention. Excellent. So it's carried. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going, moving on to item 13 to receive the leader's report. Councillor Ash Edwards. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, if you have time, you'll be pleased to know that I will endeavour to be brief. Um, so two things just to, to briefly report on. Uh, firstly, to confirm that uh, the interim report on the work on the Clare Hall site will be reported to Cabinet uh, in July, which will set out the work done by the Member Steering Group uh, so far, the analysis and the options uh, for the second phase um, of the work, which will uh, run over the summer and conclude uh, in the autumn. And it will also, uh, we will also be publishing an updated uh, property condition report, uh, which independently uh, outlines the very significant challenges faced by the current uh, building. And I'd like to just thank the members of that member steering group uh, for the work they are doing uh, and, and indeed the offers of support being provided to it, along with our independent uh, consultants on culture and the creative economy, BOP. Secondly, Chairman, uh, the Council continues to receive uh, very positive feedback from Government on last year's bid to the Level Up Fund for Burgess Hill uh, Town Centre. Um, be nice if they just approved it um, but uh, as a result of that feedback we are preparing a bid for round two uh, of luck with the goal of kick-starting uh, the town centre development uh, in Burgess Hill uh, and I'll of course keep members informed as that progresses. Thank you. Uh, Garrett, Councillor Marsh. Thank you Chairman. Does the leader agree with me that when we become councillors it's imperative that we perform to the highest possible standards after how can we expect our residents to do so as well? So does he agree with me that it's very disappointed to find that a member cannot adhere to planning conditions and planning law, especially when they purport to want to keep the countryside green? Thank you, Chairman. Okay, so Councillor Ash Edwards. Chairman, um, I think it's really important that everyone uh, sticks to the rules and uh, 
provides by planning rules, as Councillor Marsh says, and, and indeed as councils, we have a particular obligation to, uh, to set an example. Councillor Eggleston. Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I appreciate the update from the Leader of the Council uh, regarding the uh, levelling up fund bid uh, for Burgess Hill. I just wanted to, I know it involves a lot of hard work uh, for officers, it's very difficult, uh, and just want to uh, wish the officers well uh, in that submission. And I join uh, with the Leader of the Council in saying uh, that I hope that we're successful at the second time of asking. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. And now going on to the report from the Deputy Leader, Councillor Belsey. Oh, I... Councillor Alison Bennett. Is this Thank for the uh, actual leader? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and I'd like to thank the leader for his report um, and the update on Clare Hall. Um, noting that we've just uh, agreed that Clare Hall is in the leader's portfolio and as such will go to the uh, scrutiny committee for leader, deputy leader and so forth. Um, I look forward to that being scrutinised. Does he have a date for when it will be coming to scrutiny, please? That's Rash Edwards. Chairman, as I said, the report will come to the next meeting of the Cabinet. Next meeting. Thank you. So I'll now move on to the report from the Deputy Leader, Councillor John Belsey. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I already referenced uh, the uh, estate's uh, progression regarding uh, the toilets in the woodshed and uh, the Swan Mead temporary accommodation. I just briefly wanted to update Council that we continue to progress the food waste collection pilot. All households participating in the trials will be written to in the second half of July with an initial leaflet. Prior to that, we'll be briefing ward members involved in the trial, as well as towns and parish councils participating in the trial. That will be around the end of the first half of July, and we will be sending FAQs to all of our members. We'll then be issuing further comms and updating our website for that time. Uh, in the meantime, we've been undertaking further composition analysis for further benchmarking so we can understand how well the trial performs. And in light of the most recent analysis, which November last year showed food was still the largest residual component at 39% of residual waste, we will also be pushing important alternatives for, for all residents of Mid-Sussex, such as home composting and further encouragement for plastics recycling. I've also received a number of questions from members around garden waste and the lead time to get a green bin. The garden waste service, which was expanded a couple of years ago, continues to be hugely popular and we're nearing 23,000 users, which is current capacity. We are, of course, looking at how we can expand the service and to date have managed not to bring in a waiting list, but we are expecting the results of the government consultation soon and that may have a significant bearing on the proposed service redesign and the investment required on this important service collection. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Henwood, do you wish to ask <coughs> Councillor Belsey a question? Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm really keen for the food waste. Uh, to where is the food waste going to be taken to be um, biodigested? Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's my understanding at, uh, at the moment, but whilst we wait for West Sussex to develop their food waste uh, recycling capability, which we hope that they will do over the course of the trial, that we will be uh, taking the food waste to Basingstoke. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gibson. Thank you. Uh, could the Deputy Leader confirm that it will be a 3 to one uh, trial? And uh, was the 39% by weight or volume? <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gibson, it'll be a one, two, three. Yeah, three, two, one trial. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. Um, yes, it will. Uh, so that would be um, the one, two, three will be a weekly food collection, uh, bi weekly, uh, sorry, a twi uh, once every two, a fortnightly uh, recycling collection, and then a th every third week residual waste collection. And just based on the fact that it's 39% food and 15% plastics, I'm sure that must be via weight that the been doing those analysis. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Belsey. Uh, Councillor Hillier, Cabinet Member for Economic Growth and Net Zero. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'll start with a summary of some of the work being done around the net zero part of my portfolio, um, starting with some feedback from the fifth and my second West Sussex Joint Climate Change Board meeting today. As you'd expect, and all the districts and boroughs are working collaboratively with the West Sussex on this very important bit of work. So uh, key items being discussed included an update on how West Sussex local authorities are proceeding towards the decarbonisation of their estates. Uh, and as per my earlier answer to Mr Brooks, I was able to report on our phased approach. Uh, and it is our belief that using this evidence-based approach, approach will give us the greatest chance of achieving our prospective realistic targets. Unlike 53% of the 127 local authority chief executives surveyed, who are not confident of hitting their stated targets. Uh, we also discussed how we can work together on carbon offsetting and sequestration, and I reported that Mid-Sussex will be looking to our prospective refreshed district plan to feature new and enhanced policies in this area, and was proud to provide a list of details which I've got, but I shan't repeat here out of courtesy for what's remaining of members' evenings. Uh, finally, in this area, as I have done very recently with my officer team, I suggested to the West Sussex group that we also need to look at what reasonable measures we should all be taking to make our areas more resilient to climate change. For example, flooding and, paradoxically, water resilience, increased temperatures affecting homes and workplaces, and therefore power uh, consumption, and also its impact upon our species. Again, just for an example, are we planting tree species that may not actually thrive in a slightly increased temperature climate? Uh, and it's been agreed that that will be a piece of work brought forward at the next meeting. Uh, moving on to the next section of my portfolio, the Burgess Hill Growth Area, I'm delighted to say that the green circle is 99% done, and the green links are 97% done, both of which will be completed this month. And this has been a huge investment into Burgess Hill, and terrific partnership working with West Sussex and Homes England, and the result is a really superb network of cycling and walking pathways around and into the town about 14 kilometres of which I had the pleasure of recently cycling. Uh, it's a fantastic bit of work, and as I've said on numerous places, I have serious Burgess Hill envy. Uh, West Sussex are now about to commence their large projects to enhance the linkages and sustainable transport experience around some of the town centre. Uh, finally, in relation to the economy, hopefully members will be aware that our micro-business grant scheme is open for bids, and I would urge you to promote them to your local businesses. <coughs> Their chief aim is to support match-funded projects that will help businesses improve their sales and, to my mind, most importantly, move them towards increasing their workforces. I'm also proud to say that District Council has supported last week's Burgess Hill Business Park Association-led STEM Week with local schools and also will be supporting the forthcoming Hayward Teeth STEM Challenge and recognising that actually these are very, very pertinent to our new sustainable economic strategy. Uh, there's much more to report, but I'm very conscious of members' time after an already long meeting, uh, so I'll revisit this next council. But obviously, I'm always happy to discuss any matter with any member outside of the meeting cycle. Thank you very much. Councillor Marsh. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Just a very quick one. Can I request that Councillor Hillier work with the National Park as well? They're doing a heck of a lot of work on net zero um, and sustainability. And as it's part of your portfolio, as I'm the representative on the National Park, it would be quite good if you could work with them as well. Thank you. That's a here. Yeah, absolutely. So the National Park sit on the West Sussex Partnership Board. They're present today. And you're right, actually, they are taking the load and doing quite a lot of the work and research. Uh, I also sit and attended the rural, I can't remember what it is, the Rural West Sussex Partnership, mm. which, again, heavily features that body and have established good links with them. And you're absolutely right. And yes. See you on it then. <laughs> Councillor Henwood. I wonder if you will still be pleased to be associated with Burgess Hill when they start digging up the roads and uh, under the place and connectivity scheme. So for 40 weeks, we anticipate disruption within the Burgess Hill Town Council and Wibblesfield. I wonder if you still want to be part of Burgess Hill. Chancellor Hillier. Curiously based question, but yes, I will. Because actually these are the right things to the long-term interests of the residents and there will be disruption. There always is disruption. We've had disruption around the district, putting in our digital broadband. Do I regret being associated with that? No, because it actually is going to serve the residents for many, many, many more years. And you have county councillors 
from your party who represent Burgess Hill and it is for them and you to work together to make sure that West Sussex is doing the best possible job of managing the traffic. If I can help, I will. Thank you. Councillor Eggleston. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to um, uh, kind of second uh, Councillor Hillier's comment about the Green Circle Network. I think it's a, you know, it's a, a very good example of, of delivering an accessible um, pathway around the town. And, you know, not every bit of it is perfect, but I would say 99.9% .9 of it is really very good indeed. So I endorse that. On place and, and connectivity, I, I mean, I do share your, your view that you know, change is always difficult uh, for, for everyone, and this is a big project which is going to be disruptive for 40 weeks. I think where, the, where there's been a problem in the town, and it's not the fault of, of this council, but the way that... West Sussex County Council communicated the rollout of the 40 weeks uh, was by sticking signs up along the road rather than doing some uh, you know, communications in advance to say it was happening because it came to a surprise to us all that we saw the signs there and then it was happening, starting to happen a few days later. And you then have to manage residents going, what the heck is all of this about? Um, so I think, you know, I know there's a meeting uh, with the steering group uh, tomorrow. I certainly think it's something that we need to raise with county to ensure that they are better able, are better at communicating what they are rolling out. That's the Hillier. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, and I think you're generous to say 99% of the network is fine. There's certainly some bits where there's some hills... And obviously, we've got that really difficult problem around the West Wilmersfield station that we all need to tackle. In relation to what you make, I'm obviously not here to apologise to West Sussex County Council, despite my earlier um, um, declaration of interest. Uh, and I think you're right. And I think this is something to be discussed tomorrow. I think communications <coughs> to everybody is really, really important, be it to local towns and parishes, etc., because we know that we know our patch best and somebody doing a desktop exercise in Chichester we may be able to assist them. So I think your point is well made. Thank you. Councillor Demir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'll, I'll try and be as brief as possible so you can all get home. But I'm really glad, as this was my first report to Council on my new portfolio, to tell you that our three leisure centres are increasing their membership well and also with the number of visits are also continuing to rise. In fact, we're now around 70% of what we were pre-COVID levels. And that is really going to put us in a good position to achieve our target of 400,000 visitors and 11,000 members in this financial year. Uh, so well done, everybody. Well done, all, and all of you who swim with me. Um, as agreed, as you know, in this financial year, we have a revised management income of 600,000, but with a, a profit share for revenue generated above the threshold. And already, it looks like we might have a teeny weeny little one of those in May, from the May figures. So that would be good news as well. Obviously, as you know, Officers are in the course of negotiating for next financial year, 23, 24, <coughs> and beyond. Uh, the other thing is that with Places for Leisure, we've identified a number of decarbonisation projects. So, subject to PL making some necessary funding available, I'm hoping to be able to give you an update on that very, very soon. On the parking service data, that's also showing a growth. In fact, 20%, 21% up on last year. Uh, so the only problem is season tickets, which also saw an increase, uh, are still 43% below right. the same pre-COVID period. However, that is an encouraging sign, I'm sure you'll all agree. And if it means that perhaps businesses 
are going to be or looking at or are even are relocating to Mid Sussex instead of our people commuting out of area to work, then that's even better news for us, isn't it? So let's hope that's true. Finally, the first phase of our EV charging points project with West Sussex, uh, the little project, big project, is rolling out. And actually, phase one is more or less complete. That 66 have been installed in our council car parks, both in the towns and the villages. Um, connected Curb are currently looking at preparing a list of potentially viable further locations here. Probably most of them will be on the street and that will take a little longer, but there's more coming. Um, we also have plans to install some in disabled bays and I'll report on that to you very soon, but that's good news. I'm happy to take questions, happy for you to contact me anytime. Councillor Jackson. Not, I know that we've got some in the Hurstbeer Point Trinity Road car park, yeah. but I did actually notice that some of the residents with diesel cars were parking there. Uh, what position will the District Council take in enforcing proper use of those electric charging points? Thank you for that, Councillor Jackson. Uh, we obviously do enforce, as we do enforce with ordinary parking, so um, uh, our officers will certainly keep an eye on that and I will come back and report to you when perhaps they could do some patrols around there. That would be all right. Councillors, we... Um, oh, Councillor Andes. Thank you, Joan. Yes, uh, just wondering about the charging point in Burgess Hill. still doesn't seem to be working, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm okay if you answer in writing later on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reeves. Can you tell me which car park it is in Burgess Hill? Cypress Road. 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 I'll also check answer. Okay, thank you. I'll check on it and come back to you. <laughs> Councillors, it's now um, seven, eight minutes to ten. The deadline is ten o'clock. If we have two more reports and we have questions from uh, Councillor Gibson, who assures me they're three-minute questions, but I think we need to take a vote if we are going to extend past the 10 o'clock. Could you all vote now, please? I'm going to move on. I can see the vote is against. Oh, we haven't finished. I apologise. No. No. So we are going to just move, um, go yeah, on to. It's 15 in favour, 26 against, and one abstention. So it will end at 10 o'clock, Chairman. It'll be just in time for you to join me for a drink in the open. Yeah. Okay, so we are now going on to the Cabinet Member for Community, Councillor Webster. Thank you, Chairman. In the interest of time, I will just take the opportunity of reminding members of the programme of free play days taking place across the district, as included in MIS today. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to remind councillors of the new integrated care system which is coming into being on the 1st of July to replace the um, variety of CCGs we have across Sussex and the ICS is beginning a series of engagement exercises across 
West Sussex that from this coming Friday, and I've emailed members about that. And I was pleased to see a number of Armed Forces Day commemorative events across the district last weekend, because our armed forces go above and beyond to protect the lifestyles which we enjoy today, and we often take them for granted. And of course, the highlight of recent weeks was the Platinum Jubilee, and the country was abuzz with parties, parades, and church services, and we did Her Majesty proud. And that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Epps. I cannot see any questions, so I'm going to pass on to Councillor Robert Salisbury. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, taking a vote took three minutes out of it. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is brief. Reflect on that when you say that before a meeting. Uh, we've run a number of uh, training sessions for the planning committees, um, and we throw open the one on enforcement uh, to all members so that they are better placed uh, to answer questions from their residents. Uh, and we will be circulating the slides from that round to everybody so that you've got an aid memoir if you are uh, asked for anything. Thank you. Thank you. We're now moving on to item 15, which is uh, a questions from members pursuant to Council Procedure Rule 10.2. Um, it, this is from uh, Councillor Gibson. With your agreement, Madam Chairman, I'd like to withdraw both questions. <laughs> thank you very much. On behalf of all members, thank you very much, Councillor Gibson. I'm going to conclude the meeting and ask my members to remain in place for a few moments until the DSO indicates the live stream has ended. And thank you very much for your attendance. And I hope some of you can stay to have a quick drink in the Oakland's room with me. Thank you very much. Give us a drink. Yeah.